Audiobook title A Tale of Steel and Gunpowder, 01-41, by Pixito Kaisuke 14. This work belongs to author, Pixito Kaisuke 14. Source, scribblehub.com. Chapter 1, Waking Up in Another World. Inside a village north of the city of Ares, the sound of metal striking metal could be heard. Inside a forge is someone you won't expect in a place like a blacksmith's. A little girl, probably not older than seven years old, is hammering away at a steel ingot she just heated up. This girl is no ordinary girl, though. She can lift the heavy hammer because she has been blessed by the god of strength. At least, that's what the church said. Nira sighed as she took a break from hammering the steel ingot. After which, she placed the ingot back into the furnace so that she could make it malleable to shape it once again. She knew inside that what she is making is near impossible with the current tools she has available, but she is still trying to bend the ingot into a barrel. With the help of a steel rod, she managed to whack the metal into shape and then breathe a sigh of relief afterwards. She quenched the newly made barrel in cold water before slowly grabbing it. In this world, the word barrel means a container for something, but not to Nira. This piece of steel tubing means something very different. This should be good, not perfect, but this is something I can work with. At least that is one piece completed, she thought to herself. She then placed the newly forged barrel in a hidden drawer. She then extinguished the fires that kept the furnace running and went to clean herself. Afterwards, she changed into a nightgown and went to bed beside her sleeping little sister, Nira. That was the name her parents, Mabel and Marcus Augustine, gave her. Nira still remembered how she got into this world. After a tiring day as a professional gunsmith, Theodore wanted to sleep. He closed his eyes and opened them after what he thought was a few hours earlier. He was welcomed by the sight of a wooden roof. He noticed that he could not move his body, no matter how many times he tried to do so. Glancing to the side, he spots what could be described as a baby. He then noticed wooden walls that surrounded him, and it didn't take a detective to connect all the dots. He was reborn. Theodore wondered if he had died in his previous life, but he shook those thoughts the moment he heard the door to the room open. Two adults, one male and one female, came into her view. The male picked up the baby that was beside her, and the female picked him up. Our daughters are so adorable, the male said while gently cuddling what he assumes is his sister. But wait, daughters, does this mean that he was reborn as a girl? This left him in a small shock. Well, Getting reborn has a 50 50th chance of giving you your desired gender, so Theodore discarded her shock and focused on the scene that is happening to her now. Dear, it's morning. It's time to open up the shop. Her mother said as her father nodded and gently placed her sibling inside the crib Theodore had founded himself in. But Theodore was left curious, though. What kind of shop were they talking about? She asked herself inside her head. So to try and get them to take her to their shop, she made little baby noises and movements to try and get her parents to take her there. Her mother did not get the message, though, and she giggled. Oh Nira, such a lively baby as ever. You'll tire yourself out if you keep moving like that. She said, just like she said, Theodore, no, Nira felt her eyes. Feeling like weights that wanted to close her eyes. Soon after she did so, she went to sleep as her mother hummed a lullaby. 63. Chapter 2. The Life of a Blacksmith. Another day has arrived, and Nira woke up to the smell of fresh bread and cheese. She noticed that her sister had already woken up and left the room. It was understandable since she had spent all night working to get the barrel she forged straight and without any rough surfaces. So, scratching her eyes while yawning, she stepped out of the bed and walked towards the bathroom. Inside, she took a good look at her facial features, red eyes with black, messy hair and a cute face befitting a seven-year-old. She had to wonder though since she is seven, does she have to deal with that soon? She shook her head and went to take a shower. After which she grabbed the towel and covered up her naked body. She was still blushing a little bit, though, and mentally facepalmed. Seven years in this body and I still can't get used to seeing myself naked. She shook those thoughts again and went outside the bathroom. From there, she paced towards the cabinet to pick out the clothes she would be wearing today. She decided to pick a black shirt with shorts, it's not an especially stylish choice. It was because it could get really hot while the furnace was running inside the forge. Stepping out of her and her sister's room and going downstairs, she found herself in the kitchen and noticed that her mother and sister were also with her. Her sister was eating the food while her mother was busy cooking. Oh. Nira is awake. Her sister said so while stuffing her mouth full of food. Slow down, little one, 
you might choke on your food, Mia Abel reminded her daughter. Have a seat, dear, your father went ahead and opened up shop. She continued motioning for her to sit down and eat. Nira nodded with a smile and sat down adjacent to where her sister was eating. She noticed her breakfast consisted of eggs, bread, and cheese. A normal breakfast for this world. Nira, did you make some cool weapons for customers yesterday? Her sister, Ellie, said. Not much, dad is busy with the forging, my job is just to sharpen swords and such, Nira replied. Then again, dad has been teaching me some smithing techniques to make weapons, so maybe sometime soon I can start making swords for our customers. She added them and thought about the other parts she needed to complete the gun she was building. Speaking of your father, he's waiting for you inside the shop, sweetie, so go ahead and don't keep him waiting, her mother reminded her. Nira nodded with a smile and went on to finish her breakfast in record time, after which she got up and started walking towards where the forge was located. Walking into said forge, she could hear metal striking metal and took a good look at the place while nobody was using their services for the time being. The shop is big, but the things inside it made it look quite cramped. To her right were metal storage containers where they keep various types of metals, such as iron, steel, zinc, tin, brass, and copper, in their ingot forms. To the left is the furnace, where they melt down the ingots and cast them into different shapes according to the requirements of the customer. A second, smaller furnace can be seen beside it, currently turned on. It's used to heat up the ingots so that they can be malleable and easy to bend using an anvil and a hammer. Beside the storages where they keep the ingots is the quenching station, where they dip different types of swords, specifically steel and iron swords, into oil or water so they can be stronger. Next to that is the grinder wheel, where dull swords can be sharpened using a rotating wheel. In the center are two anvils one of which is being used by her dad as he hammers away at a heated piece of steel. North of all of that is the counter where customers can order and buy swords or other tools that are forged by her father. Behind the counter is, of course, an assortment of different kinds of swords, from short swords to long swords to rapiers to daggers, and, of course, different tools that are required for specific tasks, such as shovels, hoes, axes, and pickaxes. Near the doorway to the entrance of the forge is the cabinet and crafting bench where she was seen last night making a gun barrel. Her father stopped hammering the ingot for a second and took a look at his daughter. Good morning, Nira. He greeted her, saying, we need to get ready for the morning rush. Tons of adventurers and guards would want their weapons sharpened and ready for anything. He motioned for her to man the counter and grind wheel. Nira sighed and nodded. She put on her apron and stepped in front of the counter and unlocked the door. Turning a sign that says open, she then stepped back behind the counter to open the shop for today. 62. Chapter 3. Advancements. Just like that, the morning rush came in. Dozens of adventurers and villagers wanted their weapons and tools maintained. Nira was on the clock, managing the orders for new weapons and gear while her father did all the heavy lifting with the forging and casting. Nira was also busy sharpening swords at the request of the customers. When the midday sun was overhead and the morning rush ended, both Marcus and Nira sighed deeply as she gazed up at how much money they made. Being in a moderately big village has its advantages, for one, there was a nearby dungeon that adventurers frequently visited to grab loot and, of course, fight monsters. Their weapons would need some maintenance after fighting in the dungeon, so they traveled here to get them fixed and maintained. Why don't you grab lunch for yourself, Nira? Marcus said tiredly, I'll keep an eye out for any late customers that would want our services. He continued as Nira nodded and exited the forge. She paced through the house and into the kitchen, where her mother was already there, preparing lunch for the father-daughter duo. He he, I knew you two would be hungry after the morning rush. So I made some sandwiches for you and your father. She giggled and placed the last sandwich in a basket. Thanks mom. Nira exclaimed gleefully as she took the basket and walked back to the forge. Inside, her father was waiting for any new customers to come in the front door. He was sitting on a stool near the counter, so Nira slowly maneuvered her way through the now messy forge. When she got near, her father noticed her and turned in her direction with a smile. Hey, that me Abel, she always knows. He let out a small laugh as he stood up and washed his hands in a bucket of water. Mom somehow has a third sense that knows when we need food. Nira commented as she grabbed a sandwich from the basket and started eating. But it still tastes so good, she added. Marcus let out a small giggle as he ruffled Nira's hair, grabbing his own sandwich from the tray and looking at the many types of swords that were waiting to be sold. 
Just like that, the two finished their lunch and are now waiting for any latecomers to come to their shop. While waiting, Marcus took the liberty to train Nira in the art of blacksmithing. Just like the morning rush, the evening rush had arrived. Again, dozens of adventurers and villagers wanted to get their tools and weapons maintained. So Nira and Marcus kicked it up a notch and went to their respective jobs like earlier. Only this time, Nira would help her father with the forging and the heating of solid metals. After it ended, the two were left on the floor, breathing heavily. The last adventurer just wanted his blade sharpened, and Nira obliged to do so. Just another day in the shop, huh? Marcus slowly stood up and helped her daughter get back on her feet. Yeah, still hectic as ever, Nira added. You should go rest, dad, you did all the heavy lifting with the forging. She continued. Are you sure you don't need help with the cleanup? Marcus asked with an eyebrow raised. Sure, I'm sure. Plus, I am working on something important. Nira answered as she started picking up discarded handles for swords and tools needed to forge the swords. All right, if you say so, but you have to tell me your little project after it's done. Marcus said and slowly walked to the exit, but before he did, he turned his head back at Nira. Call me if you need any help. He said as Nira nodded, and the former exited the room. All right, let's get to work. Nira said to herself as she walked towards the crafting table and drawers and picked up the barrel she had just made yesterday. Said barrel was crude, the sanding was not quite finished on the outside part, but the inside is smooth as a whistle. The next step is to make the mechanism for the trigger she then proceeded to open a drawer, and inside were small springs. She then collected the steel scraps that her father had left from forging, and proceeded to place it inside a crucible, which she took to a bigger furnace to melt it down. While the furnace was heating and melting the steel scraps, she picked them up earlier. She prepped the mold, which was difficult since she doesn't have a basis for it. She looked around, trying to find a shape that she could use as a basis to make the cavities needed. Her eyes fell on hooks used in fishing. Smiling, she walked over and detached the hooks from the rods, and used that as a basis to make the cavity. After that she used two small flatted iron rods to make the cavity for the frizzen which would produce sparks once the hammer bears down on it. Then, she used two half-circle metal pieces and used them to make the cavity for the hammer. She slowly took out the molten steel from the furnace and carefully poured it into the cavities inside the casting sand. While waiting for it to harden, she took note of the measurements of the flintlock pistol she was trying to make. After a while, the parts she needed had fully hardened, so she took out the parts that resembled small flat hooks, one resembled the letter S and one the letter L. Nira sighed in relief as the parts were the perfect size for her needs. There were four parts in total, and the last two bits were quite important to the finished product. She took the liberty to sand down each individual part using the grindstone. She was satisfied with the finished product. She then laid down the parts on the table and connected them all using the springs from earlier and used metal pins to hold the parts in place inside an iron frame. When she pulled the trigger, the S-shaped hook on the top part of the weapon, known as a hammer, came blitzing down, nearly missing the other L-shaped hook which was standing still. Satisfied, Nira hammered some holes near one end of the barrel and inserted it at the front of the trigger mechanism. When she pulled again, the same thing happened, but the hook she fired off nearly missed the opening of the holes inside the barrel. All right, just a little more to go. I just need a piece flint now. Afterwards, I can go ahead and make a wooden handle for it, as well as the black powder and steel balls. She said to herself and smiled. 57. Chapter 4 Unfortunate circumstance. Satisfied with her work, Nira placed the contraption, which is soon to become a flintlock pistol, inside a drawer that was opened. She stood up, grabbed the broom that was on her left, and started cleaning the forge. After a while, she eventually finished, and the forge looks brand new. With a smile, she removed her apron and proceeded to walk to the exit of the forge, not before her sister was waiting for her at the doorway. Hi Nira. She greeted him, saying, Dad said you've been working on a cool new project. Can I see it, please? She said the last word with the cute little puppy eyes she always does. Nira sighed. She didn't have the heart to reject her sister with that face, so she motioned for her to come into the forge. Inside, Nira led her sister to the workbench and pulled one of the drawers. Don't tell mom and dad about this, okay? Nira said, and Ellie nodded. Nira took the unfinished flintlock pistol and laid it down in front of Ellie. This is it. Nira said as she gazed at her sister's reaction. Ellie had stars in her eyes as she looked at the unfinished firearm. Woho, what is it? And what does it do? Ellie looked at her sister for a reply. 
That's a secret until I manage to finish it, so while it's not done, don't tell mom and dad. Nira said while putting her pointing finger near her mouth in a signal to her to keep it a secret while she winked. Okay. Ellie gleefully said as Nira picked up the device and placed it back inside its drawer. It is getting late. Did mom and dad already go to bed? Nira and Ellie went to leave the forge as Nira closed the door behind them. Yeah, they went to sleep a bit earlier because dad was so tired for the day, Ellie replied while walking with her sister. Then let's head to bed as well, Nira said, as she walked upstairs to their room. Before going to bed, the two sisters first washed their bodies in the bathroom and put on their sleeping clothes. Once done, they laid down on the bed. Good night, sis, Ellie said before sleeping. Good night, Ellie, Nira followed suit and slept. Nira wouldn't get the chance to go out with the remaining parts needed to finish her flintlock pistol because the following days were as busy as today was. Of course, their mother wouldn't want their seven-year-old daughters to go out on their own, so Nira would be a bit frustrated. Nira did plan to sneak out of the house once, but she feared she might get banned from working on her project if either her mother or father found out what she was doing. So she waited until she was the right age to go to the market and buy the remaining parts to complete her pistol. Every day, she would check on the condition of the parts to ensure that they would not rust or deform in any way. That proved to be a good choice, though, because one night, due to the heat and cold stress that expended and shrank the steel, the barrel she made was deformed and filled with cracks. She needed to fix it before she was able to fire the weapon for the first time. So she set about it once again. She heated a piece of steel inside the furnace and struck the orange hot steel with a hammer on the anvil until it was flat. She then used a steel rod that was already measured to the preferred dimensions to hammer the steel into the shape that she needed it to be. After it was done, she proceeded to heat it thoroughly and dunk it into a waiting container of oil to subsequently cool it. Doing this helped harden the steel so it could handle the explosion that would propel a projectile forward. After she sanded it thoroughly, she removed the old, cracked barrel and replaced it with the newly forged one. This barrel however has a thicker base so that it would stop any crack or deformity from happening. Satisfied, she placed the entire gun back inside its drawer and went on to sleep that night. Spoiler, 7-year-old Nira Augustine, 7-year-old Ellie Augustine, so I used Denari to help you visualize what the two looked like. I'll post another image when they become teens and adults adventurers so look out for that. As always thanks for reading, also, for the smokeless powder. I have the basic gist of it but... It will not be fully accurate since companies keep the mixture top secret and the chemicals needed are pretty complex. But I will try my hardest to get it as close as possible to the actual in-world smokeless powder. Collapse. 49. Chapter 5. Growing up. Nira, while waiting to be the right age to start buying the parts needed to finish her project, took the liberty to learn a few things under her mother's supervision. This happened every time they ran out of a certain metal so the forge would be closed so that her father would go out and buy some from the local mine. Nira had learned about the currency system that uses copper, silver, and gold. A simple system that requires 100 of something less valuable to make it equate to one of the value of something more valuable, for example, 100 copper coins equaling one silver coin, 100 silver coins equaling one gold coin, and 100 gold coins for one platinum coin. The currency system was simple yet effective. At the tender age of 10, her mother told her stories. How a hero banished a demon lord to the depths of the underworld along with his army and nation, never to be seen again. How kingdoms rose and fell due to their own pride, and how even the purest of souls can be corrupted with demonic magic. Magic was something completely new to her. If you explained magic to someone from her own world, they would just laugh it off and call you a dunce. But in this world, magic is very real and very beautiful. She explained that magic uses different elements to form skills, but she couldn't dive into the subject further because she only knows basic information about it. Nira thought for a while. If elemental magic exists, then it would be possible for her to develop a skill that can help her mill steel, which in turn can make even bigger and better firearms. Her mother explained that gaining these skills would be incredibly hard. That is why only those who are truly dedicated to their work can gain and master these skills. And the reason why casters are so sought after by the kingdom she was living in. Nira knew that by learning magical skills, she could become a target for the kingdom. She shook her head, determined to learn the skills necessary to replicate steel milling. During her growth, she also felt pain on her chest, and every time she woke up from sleeping, she noticed that her breasts were growing slowly. But the problem was that she was only 12 at the time. 
Mira calculated that if they kept growing at the same pace they are now, they would make her too top-heavy by the time she was old enough to set off to become an adventurer. Nevertheless, she paid no more heed to it and hoped they stopped growing. On another note, she decided on becoming an adventurer after realizing that, in order to gain the skills and materials necessary to build more complex firearms, she would need to explore the world and discover new things for herself. Meanwhile, Ellie had also been learning how to craft swords, but unlike Nira, Ellie had been studying how to use it in secret. Only her father and mother knew that she was training on how to use the blade. They were hesitant of course, letting a 14-year-old girl start sword training, but Ellie's persistence was soon rewarded with the training she wanted. Her main reason is to why she wanted to learn to use the sword, so that one day she could protect her twin sister when they eventually join the Adventurers Guild. Years have passed, and she is now 16 years old. She was finally old enough to start going to the market on her own, and the chance finally came to finish her project. Her mom gave her a list of what to buy, but she asked for a bit more money so that she could finish her long-awaited project. Her mother agreed, and she set off with two silver coins and 26 bronze coins. The village got a massive number of citizens during its time, so much so that in just a few years, the small town became a small city, complete with its outer walls, guards, and market. The primary reason for this is the nearby dungeon, which provided the village with all of its goods to sell to other cities. Arriving at the market, she first had to get the important things her mother assigned to her on the list, and after a while she carried a couple of bags. The money she was left with was one silver coin and 42 bronze coins. Luckily for her, there was a shop selling flint for two bronze coins. She only needed one, but she ultimately bought six of them. Arriving at home, she sat down the things her mom asked her to buy and immediately ran towards the forge. Sitting on the crafting table and grabbing the unfinished flintlock pistol from the drawer, she measured the flint and found the right measurements for it to be able to fit on the hammer. Once she hammered some pieces of it, she gently attached it to the hammer and locked it in by folding the metal from the sides into it and pinning it to the hammer. After it was done, Nero was confident it would spark, so she pulled the trigger. She was correct though, sparks flew onto the flash pan where a small amount of gunpowder would have been on it waiting for the sparks. Once it get lit, the ensuring fire would travel inside the barrel by means of a flash hole. A hole that directly leads to the bottom of the barrel. Now that everything is in place she just need the ammunition now. The only problem is, where can I find gunpowder? Spoiler, 14 year old Nira Augustine. 14-year-old Ellie Augustine, Collapse, 49, Chapter 6, The Search for Black Powder, her satisfied smile turned into a frown of frustration, how come she didn't plan on this sooner, gunpowder is a big part of what makes firearms work, she needs to find a source for it now, or the work she had put into making the flintlock would all go to waste, she sighed and got off the chair, she then left the smith to go grab her cloak, which she wears when going to the market, she does this because every time she goes there, her body gets assaulted by stares from both men and women alike. Her body was getting more mature, with all the curves a woman would dream of, along with bountiful chests that sometimes offset her balance. Nevertheless, she is dead set on finding a source of gunpowder for her weapons. Nira, where are you going? A voice behind her said turning around, Nira saw Ellie, who was staring at her with her head to the side. Ellie has also begun to mature. Like Nira, Ellie has also made the transition from a little girl into a petite woman. Though her chests aren't the same size as her twins. She had ruby red eyes, the same as Nira. The only difference between the two is that Nira has long hair tied into a ponytail that reaches her thighs, while Ellie has shorter hair that goes down to her neck. I'm just going to the market again to get more materials to finish my project. Nira replied, turning her body towards Ellie. Can I come along? Mom already said I could. Ellie spoke while stepping forward to put on her shoes. Nira nodded and replied, I don't see why not. The two spent two hours roaming around the market trying to look for gunpowder, but true to Nira's fears, they couldn't find any. What are we looking for, Nira? It's been two hours, and we still haven't found what we're searching for. Ellie sat down on the edge of the fountain in the middle of the plaza. You'll know when you see it, it looks like black powder, replied Nira, sitting beside her. Maybe it's sold in a different city. Ellie advised. Probably, Nira agreed. Let's just head home for the day. She continued, and Ellie agreed to it. That got Nira thinking, though. Of course gunpowder would not be available on the market since none of the guards poses any kind of firearm. It could be that the nobles are hoarding it. 
but I highly doubt that would be the case since the gossips don't even mention the explosive powder once. Once they were out of the market area, Nira heard two men talking to each other on the side of the main road. Hey, are you heading out? said one of the men. Yep, heading to Aries tomorrow. What's wrong? He replied. I'd postpone it if I were you, the first man said with a serious expression. Why? The weather looks good, plus there are no bandit sightings on the route to Aries. The second man looked puzzled as to why his friend was worried. The first man sighed and looked at him. You idiot, do you wonder why there are no bandit sightings? Why? Doom's limes had been spotted in the area, the first man said, to which the second guy seemed shocked. You mean the slimes that blow up? The first guy looks kind of irritated, so he hits the second guy lightly with his hand. Why do you think they're called doom slimes? Idiot the first guy said, as he sighed at his friend being dumb again. Yeah, I think I'll postpone the ride to Aries for a few days, said the second man with a sad expression. Nira, on the other hand, was absolutely ecstatic. These slimes could be the basis from which she could make gunpowder. If she were able to get a sample of the slime, she could try using it in place of the charcoal, sulfur, and nitrate solution found in gunpowder. Or maybe the slime itself has those compounds, and she just has to turn it into powder form. Nira smiled like a kid who had just gotten their mom to buy them a shiny new toy. So Nira and Ellie rushed to their house. Ellie, though, was a bit confused as to why her twin sister was full of energy all of a sudden. After they arrived home, Nira took off her cloak and sat down on a chair. Her sister excused herself because their dad called her when they arrived. Nira, now sitting alone, thought of a plan to procure a sample of those doom slimes. Well, the obvious way is to register as an adventurer and take an extermination quest to kill the slime, but that would be dangerous only because Nira, in her past life, was only taught how to use any kind of gun. Not close quarters fighting with a sword. Then it hit her. Why not just pay the guild to set up a doom slime extermination quest? And have adventurers do the task for her. Of course, she would have to provide the rewards for the adventurers as well as pay the guild for their services. But that is better than going out there herself without a gun to defend. So she grabbed her pouch, where she saved up 40 silver coins from her monthly allowance. She then donned her cloak once more while she put on her shoes. I knew saving this much money would come in handy one day. Nira smiled to herself and went ahead to walk to the Adventurers Guild. 47. Chapter 7. Enlisting the Guild's Help. This is Nira's first time visiting the Guild, so during her walk she asked some people for directions. The once dirt road turned to stone as she neared the Guild. According to the people who gave her directions, the Guild is a huge stone building near the City Hall. She'll definitely not miss it with a landmark like that. When she arrived at the Guild, she was very impressed by the architecture. Two stone pillars with what looked like blue gemstones at the top of each pillar guarded two large wooden doors that were made of wood with iron reinforcement. The walls looked like cobblestone from the outside, and they led to an enormous roof complete with roof tiles and huge windows that illuminated an office inside. She presumed that office would belong to the guild master of this branch of the guild. Wooden support beams can also be seen on the four corners of the buildings to help them cope with the weight of the roof. The building itself looked like it had multiple floors and judging by its size, it looked like it had three floors to work with. Opening the huge doors that led inside, she was greeted by the smell of beer and food. Inside, different adventures could be seen eating, drinking, and overall having a good time while guild maids go around and serve people their food and drinks. To the left is a board where multiple papers are pinned. Nira assumed this is where they choose which quest they are willing to take. Adjacent to that is the front desk, where all the transactions are made and next to that is the stairwell, which they could walk to reach the second floor. Next to the stairwell is a wooden door, which she just assumes is a utility room for storing cleaning supplies. The adventures inside paid no heed to her as she walked towards the front desk. Waiting for her is a guild maid with long blonde hair tied into a bun. Welcome to the Redfield Guild. How can I help you? She greeted me with a friendly smile. I'm here to file for a quest, Nira said, taking off the hood of her cloak. Oh. And what kind of quest do you like? She asked, still with that friendly smile. It's an extermination and drop gathering quest for doom slimes, Nira replied, and the guild maid nodded. The guild maid then took out a piece of parchment and grabbed a quill. She then started filling in the spaces provided, such as the type of monster to be killed. What material do you need from the doom slimes? She asked, peeking at her head from the desk she was writing on. Um, what do they drop? 
Nira asked as the barmaid thought for a second. They dropped two things, their magic core and doom slime extracts, which we call debris. She answered, snapping her gaze back at Nira. Why is it called debris? Nira asked about it. Well, it's called that way because mags and alchemists can't come up with something that could use it. It doesn't do much but poisons the ground around where the slime dies. She explained, to which Nira nodded. Okay, then can you please collect that? Nira asked, but the barmaid turned skeptic. Are you sure? The debris doesn't even fetch a single copper coin on the market. What are you planning to use it for? She asked, and Nira answered. It's so I can finish a project of mine. She scribbled on the parchment, taking notes, and looked back at Nira. How many would you need? Nira thought for a second and came up with an answer. I'll need ten bottles of it, Nira said. The guild maid nodded and wrote down the amount needed to finish the quest. Once done, she placed the parchment on the desk and faced Nira again. All right, then, that'll be 27 silver coins, she said. With the guild service fee and the quest rewards added in, she continued. Isn't that a little expensive? Nira was perplexed as to why it was a bit on the expensive side. Doomslimes are a class C monster. Their explosions could cause devastating damage if one is as close as 5 meters away from them. Which is why archers and mags are the usual ones to take on these kinds of quests. She explained. Nira nodded in understanding and reached for her pouch. She took out exactly 27 silver coins and gave them to the guild maid. The latter accepted it and put a stamp on the parchment she was writing on. Please check in tomorrow to see if the quest was a success, and thank you for using our services. The guild maid spoke as she smiled happily. I'll go back tomorrow then, Nira said as the guild maid nodded. With that, Nira's business was finished, and she put the hood of her cloak over her head and turned around to the entrance of the guild. When she exited the building, the guild maid sighed as she paced outside of the front desk and pinned the extermination and drop collection quests on the board. What a pretty young lady she was, she remarked about Nira silently as she went back to man her post. As the day went on, a party of four adventurers took a look at the quest board, deciding which one they should go for. Hem, which one? The brown-haired man, though, he wore a green shirt, black pants, and a leather belt with a steel sword on his waist. Hey Eric, how about this one? He turned to the muscular man beside him, who was wearing heavy armor. He wore a huge phalanx shield behind him and a smaller sword at his waist. I don't think so, Gareth. Firewolf territory is a bit far from here. Eric explained as Gareth nodded. Hey, this one looks easy, the girl beside Eric said. She had blonde hair and wore a grey tunic. Her ears were long, and on her back was a quiver with several arrows, as well as a bow that was on her body. A doom slime extermination and drop collection quest. Seems easy enough. A second girl beside her said. She wore a purple coat along with a long blue skirt. She was holding a wooden staff that had a green gem at the end. Yeah, and the reward is 25 silver. This should be really profitable. Gareth said to take the parchment off the wall. All right, it's decided then. Though I don't get why anyone would want the debris from it, the mage girl said. Yeah, but it's still a paying quest nonetheless, Hildia, Eric reasoned, to which Hildia nodded in agreement. All right, let's get this approved and buy some bottles for it. Eric announced as everyone agreed and walked towards the front desk with parchment in hand. 41. Chapter 8. Nira the Chemist. The next day, Nira arrived back at the guild. In front of her were ten bottles that contained an orange-red substance that glowed a little. Here's the debris that you requested. The adventures really did a good job of collecting it. The guild maid said. Do you require a small basket for it? She continued and asked. Oh, no thank you, I've already brought one just in case, Nira replied, as she took out the basket and placed it on the counter for the guild maid. The guild maid then placed all ten bottles inside the basket and gave it to Nira. Thank you for using our services. Please come back again if you have another request, the guild maid said while bowing. Nira nodded and proceeded to leave the guild. She rushed home in excitement at the possibility of synthesizing gunpowder from the ooze. Arriving home she took off her cloak as well as her shoes. She then walked quickly to the forge, where the shop is still closed. Guess dad is still out there getting metals for the forge, Nira said to herself. She then proceeded to sit on the chair beside the crafting table and took out one of the bottles from the basket. Opening it up revealed that the liquid inside did not have any aroma and was more like a gel than a slimy substance. Nira was thinking when she remembered that gunpowder is composed of three main ingredients, the fuel, the stabilizer, and the oxidizer. 
Nira needed to know which of the three main components the gel inside the bottle was for, so she used a metal stick and stuck it inside the bottle. When she pulled out a small amount of the gel, it was on the end of the stick. She thought that in order to find out, she would light it with fire. If the fire burns brighter, it's an oxidizer. If it gets bigger, it's a stabilizer, and if it catches the gel on fire, it's the fuel. So, using the furnace, light a small wooden stick on fire. She placed the gel near it to see its reaction. To her dismay, though, it did nothing. Nira was not willing to give up, though. She thought for a second that maybe she could get the gel to crystallize by heating it up inside a crucible using the smaller furnace that they have. Nira followed through and turned on the furnace. Then she poured a bottle of the gel into the crucible and placed it inside the furnace. While it was heating up, Nira did nothing but see if the gel would react to the extreme temperatures inside the furnace. Her hopes were slightly dashed, though, as the gel remained in its semi-liquid form. Did she need to do the exact opposite and use extreme cold so that it would crystallize? That's how most crystals are formed. Nira thought, maybe it needed to slowly increase the temperature, so she did exactly that. She turned off the furnace and let it cool. After it did, she turned on the furnace again and placed only a couple of pieces of charcoal inside it to slowly heat up the crucible again. She sighed in relief as she spotted the gel forming little granules, a brilliant reminder that the gel was crystallizing. This was interesting for Nira because compounds only crystallize at slowly cooling temperatures, not the opposite. Nevertheless, after all the gel crystallized, she pulled the crucible out of the furnace and let it cool. Once cool, she tried to do the experiment she did earlier and placed it near an open flame. She noticed that the fire burned brighter, which meant that what she had just made was an oxidizer for the gunpowder she was making. She smiled in satisfaction at her little achievement. Later on, she focused back on the synthesis of the powder. Now that the crystallized gel can be used as an oxidizer, she needed the fuel and stabilizer for it. In her old world, the fuel and stabilizer roles are provided by charcoal, which she has on hand, and sulfur. Nira thought for a bit where could she get some sulfur. Then she remembered that in the medieval period, sulfur could be found in fertilizer. The best part is that she just happened to see a shop in the market area that sells fertilizer. She got up from her seat and went to grab her cloak. Mom, I'm going to the market to buy some things. Nira yelled while putting on her shoes. Okay Nira, just get home before dinner, we're having fish, Mabel replied with a yell from the kitchen. Nira nodded and stepped out of the house, putting on the hood of her cloak. It didn't take long for her to arrive at the market area and find the shop that she remembered that fertilizer could be bought from. When she entered the shop, an old man greeted her. Hello, young lass. What do you need from me shop? He said while he wore that friendly smile the guild maid had. Can I get some fertilizer? Nira asked, to which the old man nodded. How much would YA need? The old man replied, dropping down from the counter and placing two bags, one small and one large, on the counter. I'll take the small one, please, Nira said as the old man handed her the small bag. That'll be 21 copper coins, lassie, he said. Nira nodded and gave him a silver coin. Once she got her change, the old man thanked her and waved her goodbye from the shop. What a nice young lady, the old man said as he waited for more customers for the day. Nira hurried back to her house, and once home, she took off her cloak as well as her shoes and ran to the forge. Inside, she opened the bag of fertilizer. The fertilizer was clumped a bit, so she used to sift to get rid of the clumps. She then thought of ways to separate the sulfur from the fertilizer mixture. She then remembered a way she could do exactly that. She picked up a steel box container and poured in all the fertilizer. Then, she poured water on the fertilizer and mixed it around with a steel rod to dissolve the fertilizer in the water. She then used the sieve she had earlier used to filter out the clumps and other debris that came with the fertilizer and put it into another container. Then she used oil to separate the impurities, which are other compounds, from the water that contained the dissolved sulfur. She then poured out the water that contained the dissolved sulfur into another container. Next. She heated that metal piece using the furnace, and what is left is the sulfur residue. She then chipped the residue from the steel container and put it into a mortar and pestle where she could turn it into fine dust. What is left is what Nira estimated is 200 grams of sulfur. Now that she has all three parts that are needed for the gunpowder, she mixed 10 grams of sulfur inside an iron plate, 15 grams of pulverized charcoal, and 75 grams of pulverized crystalline gel from the doom slime. She then mixed them together and what she is left with is a dimly glowing dark red powder. 
hoping that everything she did was correct. She took a small sample from the mixture and placed it on the anvil. She then grabbed a shield that her father had forged earlier in the week and hid behind it while slowly lowering a stick that had one end on fire. When the flame made contact with the compound, the fire immediately spread to the mixture and burned really bright for a brief second before dimming back down to normal. Brightness. This is what Nero wanted. She pumped her fist in joy, completely ecstatic that she made gunpowder. She then took a look at the drawer where the firearm was sat inside waiting to receive its payload of gunpowder and steel balls. Almost there, just the projectile to go as well as the wooden handle and I'm finished. She said to herself. 45. Chapter 9. Ammunition acquired. Nira made all the gunpowder she could get. Then, she placed it all inside a steel container, which was inside another steel container that was holding a bit of water. The water will prevent the gunpowder from ever igniting from the heat inside the forge. She needed to be extra careful, or else any stray heat or spark could make it explode, causing damage to her father's forge. Next, she placed a steel sheet on top so it would cover it and placed the container in a drawer underneath the crafting table. To complete the flintlock pistol, Nira only needed the projectile. She assumed she would just use steel balls, but when she thought about it, there could be monsters more dangerous than a guy with a gun back in her old world. That is why she needed to maximize the damage output of each firearm she makes to cope with monsters. The only way to do that is by using lead as her projectile. The problem is that lead is very dangerous. Inhaling the dust of the stuff would mean lead poisoning, and Nira paced around the room, thinking for a solution. Maybe she could harvest some from the ground by digging up dirt and separating the rocks from the actual lead. No, that would be a waste of time since it would lead to little yield. Then she thought of going down a mine herself to mine it, but without a respirator, that is a death sentence. Her solution came at an opportune time. Nira, I'm back. Marcus yelled, which snapped Nira out of her thoughts as her dad dragged a sack into the forge. Dad, welcome back. She greeted her father as she helped him drag the really heavy sack inside the forge. This feels heavier than last time, Nira said, wiping the sweat from her eyebrows. Oh. It must be the new metal I got from the mining guild, it cost me six silver each, he said, pulling out a silver bar. Isn't that a little expensive for an ingot? Nira said. The person who sold it to me at the mining guild said that it took a lot to get this metal out of the ground and into ingot form, he said some even died from poisoning. While others thought this metal is haunted, he explained. Be careful not to let it fragment, the people said that it would be really bad if you inhaled the dust. He explained handing Nira the bar for her to hold. Nira couldn't believe her eyes, this was exactly what she wanted. She blinked two times just to be sure that the metal she was holding was indeed lead. Why are you so surprised, kiddo? Marcus commented on the face Nira was making. Nira snapped out of her shock and turned to face her dad. She gave back the lead ingot she was holding, and Marcus put it back in the sack. It's nothing, I just hoped it would be the right metal to finish my project. Why did you even get that kind of metal? Nira said. I wanted to see the kind of things I can craft with it, we can't let it fragment so it can't be used as a tool. I can't use it as a weapon either because it's too soft. Maybe I can cast it to make pipes to transport water around instead of using iron pipes. He explained placing the lead bar back into the sack. Nira realized that her father was going to be experimenting with the lead ingot, but she needed to ask permission now or she'd never get the chance. So she mustered up her courage and asked the big question. I mentioned earlier that I needed this metal to finish my project. So can I use an ingot to see if it is indeed the right one to use? Nira asked, nervous that her father might decline. Marcus smiled, happy that her daughter wanted to do the same thing as him and experiment with the new metal. Sure kiddo, just one bar, okay. I only have three, Marcus said, smiling. Nira wore the biggest smile on her face as she hugged her father. Marcus grabbed a bar of lead from the sack and handed it over to Nira. Don't let it fragment, all right? And most of all, don't inhale it the dust from it, he warned, to which Nira nodded. Oh, by the way, what's the name of this ingot? Nira asked as she gazed at the silvery ingot she was holding. Oh, the mining guild said it was lead, he answered. Nira then nodded, and the two went about their day in the blacksmith shop. At night, Nira was already hard at work making the lead balls for her flintlock pistol. First, she needed a mold. She couldn't use the usual casting setup that she had since it would require her to sand it afterwards, which would produce dust that would poison her. She looked around and found wood that is used to make sword handles, and then she got an idea. 
Grabbing two pieces of wooden planks, she then took out her flintlock pistol and measured the bore, which is the diameter of the barrel, and took notes. Next, she slowly carved out two half circles on the wood she had and nailed down a hinge that lets the two pieces of wood close without a gap in the middle. Once she was sure that it closed tightly, she drilled a small hole in one of the parts of the mold she made. She checked again, and sure enough, it was ready for its first test run. She heated the piece of lead her father had and placed a lot of charcoal inside the furnace so that it would reach the optimal temperature where the lead would melt. When it was still melting, Nira set up a bucket on the ground and slowly took out the molten lead from the furnace. She then slowly poured it into the wooden mold she had made. The mold immediately started smoking. And after it settled, it looked solid. She opened the mold to be greeted by a shiny little ball of lead. Nira smiled in joy as she repeated the process over and over till she used up the entire ingot. She was left with 14 lead balls ready for her waiting flintlock. She then took out her flintlock pistol and measured the balls, which fit perfectly into the barrel. The she stored all of the balls inside a metal box and placed it near the drawer where the gunpowder is kept. Oh, I almost forgot that part, Nira said. While she grabbed a piece of steel, she heated it up and hammered it into a small rod. Then she grabbed another piece of wood and used the measurements from earlier to make a ramrod so that there would be no air left inside the barrel when it was reloaded. She then placed the housing for the ramrod underneath the barrel and left it there. I'll finish it up tomorrow with the wooden handle, then it's finally time to test it. She said this to herself while gazing at the firearm she was holding. 44. Chapter 10. Test Fire. Today was the big day. Nira got up from her bed excitedly, much to the curiosity of Ellie. So she got up and tapped her sister on the shoulder as she was putting on her clothes. Sis, what are you so excited about? Ellie asked with her head tilted to the side. Nira put on a white shirt as she turned around to face her curious twin, and with a big smile, she obliged to satisfy her curiosity. Today is the day you, you, and dad will finally get to see my project. Nira said with a big smile. Ellie nodded in understanding and smiled at her sister's accomplishment. After the two changed into their clothes, they ran down the steps and into the forge, where their father was waiting for them so they could get the shop open. Nira, Ellie, why the rush? Marcus said as the two slammed the door to the forge open. Dad, Nira is about to finish the project she has been trying to make since childhood. Ellie said this and lit up their father's face. All right, I also want to see what her project does, so for today, the shop is going to remain closed. He said this, and the two nodded in understanding. Nira went to get her almost completed flintlock pistol from the drawer and let her father inspect it. Interesting. So this is what you've been working on. What does it do? He said as his hand held his chin. You'll get to see it once I make a handle for it, Nira replied, putting on her apron and grabbing a piece of wood. She took measurements of the pistol and drew what looked like a pistol handle into the wood. Then, she slowly carved the wood until it was in line with the guide she was using. Both Marcus and Ellie were watching, of course. Marcus even more so because this is the first time he has actually seen Nira work on this device. The wood eventually settled at the edge of the markings Nira made to stop her from carving it too much. Nira then carved out the inside a little bit so that the trigger mechanism would fit just above it. Nira then nailed the wooden piece to the trigger mechanism, and after trying it out a few times, it was ready. It's done, Nira announced as she picked up the finished weapon in her hands. Ellie and Marcus were woken up from their little naps on their respective chairs while Nira was busy carving. Can I hold it? Marcus asked as he looked at the strange contraption Nira had made. Sure, Nira said, handing over the flintlock pistol. Marcus held the pistol by the handle awkwardly and looked at it from a craftsman's perspective. It's a little heavy at the handle, and I can see it's not perfect because the sanding on some parts is still unfinished. He commented while looking at the barrel of the weapon. But the only question now is, what does it do? He asked as he gave Nira back her self-made firearm. In short, this is my weapon when I become an adventurer, Nira said with a satisfied smile, looking at the weapon that took her years to craft. It's a weapon. He was a bit shocked. Yes, it's time to see if it works, Nira said, dragging the gunpowder and steel balls she made prior. So that's what you did with the lead ingot I gave you yesterday. He said this while looking at the lead balls. Sis, what's that? Ellie said as Nira opened the waterlogged container that had gunpowder inside it. Oh, it's a special powder I made so this weapon could work. Nira said as she dropped some powder inside a glass bottle. Then she grabbed two balls from the container that had them. All right, I got the things needed to operate this weapon. 
Let's test it out at the field near the city, she said. Ellie and Marcus nodded. The three walked out the door and eventually out of the city gates. When they reached a good distance from the outer wall, all Nira could see was a beautiful field of green stretching for miles. She could see a forest area to her north as well as mountains to the east and west. All right, let's hope this works, Nira said as Ellie and Marcus gave her some space. Nira loaded the barrel with the gunpowder she made, and then came the lead ball. She then took out the ramrod from underneath the barrel and inserted it inside the barrel to make the gunpowder and lead ball have a nice, snug fit. Then she placed the ramrod back in its holder underneath the barrel as Nira took aim at a rock that was seven meters away from her. Breathing out, Nira exhaled and pressed the trigger. The hammer with the flint attached to it immediately went down to strike the steel frizzen. When it struck the frizzen, sparks flew to the flash pan, where a small amount of fine gunpowder was waiting, which ignited and lit a chain reaction that led to inside of the barrel. A controlled explosion happened, which propelled the lead ball out of the barrel with insane speeds. When it hit the rock, the rock was obliterated by the speeding ball, and all that was left was dust. Nira noticed what had happened and jumped in joy with her fist in the air. The crude flintlock she made worked, and there seems to be no damage to the barrel or trigger mechanism. Everything worked right, and what she had now was a fully operational flintlock pistol. The only problem left is without any rifling which I makes the weapon more accurate. She couldn't fire at targets more than 30 meters away. She then took a look at her father and sister's reactions, which got a giggle from her. Ellie has her eyes wide open at what she has witnessed, her father though. His jaw was on the floor. The two were left speechless by the display. It took a few more seconds before the two could compose themselves as Marcus placed his arm on Nira's shoulder. Nira, I think you just invented a new class with that weapon. He said, yeah, sis, what are you going to name it? Ellie asked as Nira took a look at her operational firearm. How about? Ranger she said with a satisfied smile as she remembered a phrase from reading about history in her past life. Rangers lead the way. 45, Chapter 11, Trial by Fire. Unknown to the three of them, however, they were being stalked. Ellie's eyes sharpened as she noticed a presence that was aiming at her sister. Without any hesitation, Ellie tackled Nira, who was almost bitten by a dire wolf. The two fell and rolled over on the ground. Dire wolves? Their father shouted as two more showed up and started attacking. One of them was larger than the other two. Nira, Ellie, get inside the city walls. Now, Marcus shouted, pulling out a dagger from his hilt. He jumped forward and tackled one of the dire wolves. Unfortunately for him, he was kicked off by said wolf and proceeded to launch an attack of his own. The wolf pounced on the man and was about to bite his neck. Ellie came by with a dagger she'd kept for emergencies like this and stabbed the wolf in the belly. It got away from Marcus due to the danger of being stabbed again. Nira was surprised that both her father and sister had any combat experience. She almost didn't see the huge dire wolf heading her direction. At the last minute, she jumped to the side and rolled, barely getting missed by the wolf's fangs. Nira, here out of here. Dad and I will cover your escape. Ellie said as she parried another attack that was aimed at her throat. Nira couldn't let her sister and father die here, so during the heat of the battle, she tried to reload her flintlock as fast as she could. Key word is tried, she was too busy trying to reload that the bigger of the three wolves launched another attack at her. Again, she dove and rolled to safety, almost getting bit in the process. After she rolled away, Ellie countered with a stab to the creature's stomach, which forced it to pull out of the attack. If you two are willing to fight here, take out that big one. It'll send a message to the two that we're not worth the effort. Marcus shouted as he pounced on one of the wolves and sent a stab at its stomach and chest. He was tackled again before he was about to die. Ellie came and slashed at the creature's chest, making it jump off of Marcus. By me sometime, I think I can kill the big one, Nira said, then composed herself and grabbed the bottle that contained the gunpowder. The large wolf was again about to strike her before it was parried by Ellie. Marcus was also helping by parrying the other two's attacks that were aimed at her daughters. Nira skillfully managed to get the gunpowder inside the barrel as well as the steel ball. She also managed to ram it with the ramrod and cock the hammer. Once she was ready, she warned her sister to step aside. Ellie, get out of the way, Nira shouted, which Ellie heard and immediately dived and rolled to the left. The wolf was left confused by the action, not knowing the consequence of letting Nira reload. Nira had to make this shot count because this was her last lead ball she managed to carry. She pressed the trigger and smoke bellowed out of the sides as the ball was propelled into the air and ended up hitting the wolf dead in the center, 
between the eyes. The giant wolf dropped dead on the ground, which the other two wolves noticed. Filled with injuries, stabs, and cuts, the two smaller dire wolves retreated and ran away. Ellie and Marcus immediately made a beeline for Nira, who was left kneeling on the ground due to the adrenaline in her blood slowly going away. The two checked for any injuries, which Nira sustained none of, and they soon left the area, with Marcus eventually carrying Nira. When they were back at their house or forge, Mabel was sickly worried about her husband and two daughters. They left without any warning, which prompted her to berate her husband for leaving without any notice. After the three recovered from their encounter, they reported the encounter to the guild and left out the part where Nira used her new weapon to one-shot kill the large, dire wolf. The guild was puzzled, they shouldn't be straying so close to a city like this. So they launched an expedition to the forest that was composed of C and D rank adventurers. Later that night, Nir checked on the condition of her weapon. Good thing she did too, because she noticed that the barrel was cracking, possibly due to the explosive power that the gunpowder she made produced which explained why the rock she tested it on was reduced to dust. Nitra took the liberty to forge a stronger barrel with a thicker base to withstand the explosion caused by the new improvised gunpowder she made. She managed to heat treat it again and insert the barrel back into the pistol. Nira noted the big problem with flintlock style pistols and muskets, they reload too slowly. So, she devised a plan and started drawing the blueprints in her mind to make a single action revolver, while Nira was busy forging a new barrel for her weapon. Ellie was hard at training once again, determined to learn more about sword fighting so that she could better protect her twin sister from the dangers that monsters can give them. She slashed the dummy using her custom-made sword, which her father made. It looked like a fusion between the Japanese katana and the famous long sword from Britain. With one slash, she managed to cut the dummy in two as she saw the silhouette of her sister working at the forge. She could see Nira hammering away at a piece of steel so she could make her firearm better. 49. Chapter 12, Signing Up Even though Nira's weapon was complete, she would have to wait another two years to join the Adventurers Guild. During her time there, she learned advanced smithing techniques from her dad, and her mom taught her about the geography of the world. Nira also made slight adjustments to her flintlock, though adding a sight helped her aim better. With a post mounted at the end of the barrel, this helped her with aiming her firearm. During the two years, she also managed to make a musket. A longer version of her flintlock pistol, it helps her deal with longer range targets while using the pistol as a close range secondary weapon. The musket she wields has a longer barrel and a bigger wooden stock. The barrel was very hard to forge, though, so she used casting techniques to make it. Her mother also helped by making a leather sling to carry the musket around and a leather belt complete with a holster for her flintlock. The gunpowder vials used to fill her weapons with gunpowder are kept on the belt like a bandolier. And the lead balls used as projectiles are kept inside a small bag behind the belt. The bag itself is separated into two compartments, one side for the bigger lead balls used on her musket, and the other side is used as storage for the pistol's lead balls. In total, she has 10 balls in the bag, totaling 20. She also fashioned a bayonet at the end of her musket if all else failed and she was forced to fight hand to hand. She did have a small amount of bayonet training in her past life but she thought it was best not to rely on it and use the musket from long range. Ellie also went ahead and forged her own blades. The Kartana longsword mix she had was replaced with a long, curved cavalry sword. She also had a sword breaker as her secondary weapon, with gaps between the blades where she could, essentially, break the sword of her opponent or disarm them with it. She also took the liberty to wear basic leather armor, while Nira preferred mobility since she will be taking out targets from a distance while Ellie would be her vanguard not letting enemies stray too close to Nira. Today was the big day for Nira and her sister. Now, at the age of 18, the two are finally qualified to register as adventurers. Nira and Ellie headed out to the Adventure Guild, where they would register. When they arrived inside, they were being stared at by some adventurers. Particularly Nira with her strange weapon. The two walked to the front desk, where a guild maid was waiting for them. Hello. Welcome to the Redfield Guild. She greeted him. How can I help you? She smiled. Hello, um, we would like to register for the guild. Nira spoke. The guild maid nodded and bent down. She then grabbed two parchments and started writing down some things on the desk in front of her. Once she was done, a minute or so later, she handed the parchments to the two. Please write down your basic information and your preferred class. After that, we can conduct the magical compatibility assessment. She said, 
the two wrote down their respective parchments using a quill provided at the side. Mira wrote her class as archer because there isn't any class that involves a firearm. After the two finished, they handed over the piece of parchment to the guild maid. She examined the papers and took glances at Nira and Ellie. Archer? But where is your bow? She asked Nira. Um, it's just that I use a different kind of bow, she says, motioning at the musket she was carrying. That doesn't look like a bow. The guild maid said. Um, it's more like a custom weapon I made. I can assure you it works, Nira explained. She nodded in understanding and entered the room behind her. Once she came back, she was carrying an expensive looking case. Once at the front desk, facing the two, she pulled out a crystal ball that had ornate decorations at its base. Please place your hand on the ball so we may begin the assessment. She said, you go first, sis, I'll be right after you, Nira spoke, turning to her sister. Ellie nodded and walked past her sister, coming face to face with the crystal ball. This was the first time Nira would see magic in her past and current lives. Ellie hesitated a bit, but after looking back at her sister's face, she placed her hand on the ball. The ball flashed two colors, red and white. The guild maid nodded and scribbled some things on the piece of parchment Ellie had given her earlier. So the magic spells you are capable of casting are from fire and wind. She spoke out. You can take your hand off of it now. She added as Ellie obeyed and pulled her fingers away. When Ellie looked back at her sister, Nira was standing there with a proud smile and a thumbs up. This was returned with a warm smile from Ellie. Next please. The guild maid spoke. Nira then stepped forward and placed her hand on the crystal ball, just like Ellie did. The ball flashed three colors, light blue, yellow, and black. The guild maid gulped as she saw the last color and blinked twice to make sure she wasn't imagining things. She managed to compose herself and scribbled on the piece of parchment she was holding. So you are compatible with frost, lightning, and, she paused at the last one, darkness. Is there something wrong? Nira asked, a bit fearful that her aptitude for darkness magic might be bad for her, her sister, and her family. No, it's just, um. There had only been seven adventurers in the past ten years who were registered with the darkness affinity. She explained. The researchers in the Arcane School of Magical Arts deduced that the chances of one being born with the darkness affinity are one in ten thousand. I I see, I'm guessing information regarding the ability is scarce then, Nira asked. Yes, though, you could find records of it and its uses in the great library inside the capital, the guild maid said. After the sudden reaction, the maid then put a stamp on the parchments they had given her and grabbed a tin sheet. She then grabbed a black piece of fabric and placed it in between the parchment and the tin sheet, with the parchment resting on top and the sheet at the bottom. She then waved her hand above the strange sandwich and the black fabric glows a little. When she removed it, it had the personal information of Nira inscribed on it. She then did the same with Ellie and stamped both with the guild's crest. She handed over the piece of tin to Nira and Ellie as she motioned for them to come and listen to what she has to say. Congratulations! You two are now members of the Adventure Guild. I'm now going to explain to you some important information now that you are an adventurer. She said, adventures are ranked as S, A, B, C, D. Or E ranks. Right now, you two are starting as E rank adventurers. She said as the two nodded and listened. The higher you rank, the more privileges you have from our guild, but the more dangerous the quests that are available. S ranks are only deployed to the most hazardous quests that an army of C ranks cannot overcome, she explained further. For now, you two can only register for E rank quests, and of course, the more dangerous the quest, the better the rewards. If you want to register, just take a quest from the quest board and bring it here for me to register it. The time limit for the quest is also given and will depend on whether it involves extermination, escort, or just material gathering. She explained, that's it, and welcome to the Adventures Guild. She smiled, regaining her cheery aura. Spoiler, 18-year-old Nira Augustine, 18-year-old Ellie Augustine, Collapse, 47, Chapter 13, Quest and Encounter. After that, the two registered for the guild. Nira and Ellie walked to the quest board to see what was available to Ranky Adventurers. The quest board only had three available quests for Ranky Adventurers, the first was to collect any medicinal herbs near the northern forest for the local clinic. The second was to map out a relatively safe area in the forest to set up a lumber site. The third was to clear water slimes near the lake. Hum, which should we go for, sis? Ellie asked, looking at the three quests available. Hum, let's do the medicinal herbs. We only need 10 of them. 
Nira said as she pulled the pinned parchment from the quest board. All right then, you are older than me. So, naturally, you're the wiser, Ellie said while she glanced at her sister. I'm only nine minutes older than you. Nira replied with a deadpan look. Ellie shrugged as the two of them walked towards the front desk, where the guild maid was waiting for them. Hello, we would like to take on this quest, Nira said, handing the piece of parchment to the guild maid. The maid nodded and went to stamp the piece of parchment paper that said it was accepted. The maid gave Nira back the parchment and leaned forward to say something to Nira. You have three days to get the required amount of herbs until the quest is announced as void. She said, Nira nodded, and walked to the door where Ellie was waiting. All done? Ellie spoke. Yeah, let's get going, Nira replied. The two walked towards the gateway that linked the inside of the city to the outside world. Once they stepped outside, they saw the small forested area on the horizon where they could find the required herbs. The two walked for a few minutes to reach it, and once there, they started looking for the herbs they needed. The forest was very tranquil, the only noise you would hear were from the small inhabitants of the forest, such as rabbits, birds, and even small mice running around free from the touch of this world's civilization. While they walked, Nira spotted a faintly glowing object that emitted light near a small puddle on the ground. She then stepped closer and picked up the faintly glowing object. It was a plant that had blue flowers that faintly glowed a blue color and had spiky leaves that protruded from the center. Nira compared the plant she held to the image of the herb she was carrying on the parchment that detailed their quest. Hey sis, what's that? Ellie said she walked towards her sister, kneeling down beside her. I think I found the herbs we are supposed to search for, Nira said as she let Ellie take a look at the herb. I see. It should be easy to spot since it has a faint glow, she said. Yeah, let's get to work then, Nira said. Ellie nodded in agreement as the two searched the area for the herbs. After about two hours of searching, the twins found all ten herbs they needed to complete the quest. They sat down near the tree as they took a small break while Ellie counted them to make sure. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Yep, that's all the herbs needed, Ellie said as she placed it inside her sling bag. All right, let's head back then. Nira said, as she stood up. She then helped her twin sister stand up and started walking to the edge of the forest. This was boring, Ellie said while they walked past a branch. Just hang in there, we'll get to tackle more dangerous quests in the future, Nira replied while she walked under a branch. I hope it comes by fast, she replied. A sudden roar came out of nowhere, disturbing the quiet noise of the forest they stood on. What was that? Ellie said as the twins turned to face the direction of the roar. I don't know. It sounds angry, Nira said, slowly readying her musket. Two were interrupted by the sudden emergence of a strange figure. They could tell it was female based on her face and body. She leapt from the bushes and stood as she faced the bush where she came from. Another roar left the forest as a huge black bear emerged from the bush. The girl ran off and dove into another bush. The bad part is that the bear didn't follow her. Instead, it has its sights on Nira and Ellie. Without hesitating, Nira fired off the first round. The lead bull hit the bear in the leg, rendering it incapacitated. The bear roared in pain as it felt its leg pierced by the bullet. Nira looked at her sister and nodded. Ellie replied with a nod and dashed towards the bear, aiming to strike it down with a clean shash to the head. The bear managed to recover at the last moment and met Ellie's blade with its large claws. The two exchanged blows as Nira loaded her firearm again. She first loaded it with gunpowder, then the lead bull and then rammed it all with a long ramrod so it would be tight and snug inside. She then cocked back the hammer and aimed at the bear. Ellie, now! She shouted as Ellie rolled to the right, evading a right claw hook from the bear. The bear didn't notice that Nira had already fired her musket, smoke covering the barrel of the weapon as the lead ball flew towards its target. The bear's head then received an eighth hole as the bullet impacted the nose. It immediately fell to the ground, dead on the spot. Nira then checked on her sister's condition with a call. Ellie, are you okay? Ellie looked back at her sister, still sitting on the ground, and gave her a thumbs up, confirming that she was all right. Unknown to the two, the woman who seemingly lured the bear towards them looked at Nira in shock. What kind of weapon is that? She spoke in a low voice. 40. Chapter 14. Edwina the Alchemist. After the incident, Nira and Ellie stood and stared at the dead bear carcass. Who do you think was the girl? Ellie spoke, breaking the silence. I don't know, maybe it's all an accident she said. Just as Nira was about to finish the girl from earlier, she jumped out of the bush she was hiding in and faced the twins. 
Mira immediately pulled out her musket, aiming at the strange girl who had lured a huge bear towards them. Wait! 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 Don't kill me! She yelled as she immediately stopped. Who are you? And why was that bear attacking you? Mira asked, aiming her sights down at the stranger. I'm Edwinda Dalton, D-rank alchemist for the guild. She said it out loud to try to get Nira to stop put away that weapon. Nira nodded and slowly put away her musket, holding it upright on her back using the sling. What's an alchemist doing in a forest getting attacked by a bear? Ellie spoke. She looked down at Edwina's appearance and confirmed that she was indeed an alchemist. She had red hair with blue eyes and wore a brown cape with golden accents, complete with a hood. Underneath it, she wore a white tunic with brown long pants and brown boots. On her belt are several different kinds of vials, probably used for combat against hostile threats. I was looking for some materials needed to finish my experiment but, ah, that bear showed up out of nowhere and suddenly attacked me. She explained while she gestured at the events that transpired. I see, and why do you need tree sap? Nira raised an eyebrow. It's for a new potion I'm making. She said proudly sticking out her chest. What kind of potion? Nira dug deeper into the matter. A quick recovery potion, potions that recover one's stamina. She answered. All right, good luck with it then. Now on to more pressing issues, Nira said as the three then turned their sights on the dead bear. Why was this bear here? Isn't this forest supposed to be free of any large predators? Yes, it's really strange. Normally, bears are found in the denser forests, more north of here. Edwina said as she kneeled down and inspected the carcass. Hey, look at these wounds. I'm sure my sword or her weapon couldn't have done this kind of damage, Ellie said as she pointed at the bear's back, which had strange claw marks. Edwina took a closer look at the wound. This wound isn't he fresh judging by the way it's trying to heal. It could have taken a week since this happened, she said and stood back up facing the twins. This is all very peculiar. Let's head back and report it to the guild. Nira recommended it, and they agreed. The group left the scene, slowly walking south towards the city of Redfield. Say, I never did get your names, Edwina said. I'm Ellie, Ellie said. Nira, Nira said. You two really look alike, are you twins? Edwina asked. No, Nira is older than me, Ellie said while she looked at her sister. By nine minutes, Nira added. Edwina let out a small giggle at Nira's reply and continued the walk to the edge of the forest. While walking, Edwina couldn't help but look at Nira. Specifically, the strange weapon she carried along with the strange vials she had that contained some kind of powder. Hey Nira, Edwina said, tapping Nira on the shoulder. Yes, Nira answered. What's that strange looking powder inside the bottles you carry? She asked. Nira thought for a second before answering. It's for my weapon. Nira replied, to which Edwina was a bit confused. What does it do? She asked again. It's a secret, Nira replied with a little smirk. Edwina didn't dig any deeper on the composition and the uses of the strange powder Nira carried. She wanted a sample, but she already knew asking for one wouldn't help. Stealing is definitely out of the question. The two saved her life by killing that huge bear. Once they were outside the forest, the three made it to the dirt path that led to the city and followed it. Once they arrived, Nira, Ellie, and Edwina went to report the strange encounter they had. The guild assumed that there was something wrong with the northern forests where that bear should have been. So they planned to dispatch three D-rank adventurers to investigate tomorrow morning. After that, they went ahead and turned in their quest to receive their rewards. Edwina went ahead and went home to finish the potion she was making. Only six silver coins for that quest. Ellie groaned as she walked home with Nira. Well, we are just ranky adventurers right now. We'll get to more rewarding quests later, Nira said. I hope so. Ellie replied. 42. Chapter 15. Connections. The next day, Nira was in her father's forge. She wondered how she would make some gun cartridges to be able to start crafting a pistol revolver. The major drawback of the weapons she was currently using was that it took ages just to reload a single shot. With a revolving pistol, she could load six shots and fire them off one at a time. The first step is to invent the cartridge. The cartridge is a type of ammunition that consists of the propellant, which in this case is gunpowder. The projectile, or bullet, she could make by casting lead, the casing, for which she can just use parchment, and finally, the primer, for which she doesn't know where to get it. The primer is the primary means of igniting the propellant. Like the flintlock pistol she has now, the revolving pistol she wants to make also has a hammer. When the hammer strikes the primer, the latter will ignite the propellant, 
which will in turn cause the projectile to fire off. The problem is, though, where can she find the right chemical compounds to make it? For its small size, the primer actually consisted of multiple layers of different compounds, compounds that she doesn't have access to, let alone produce. She paced around inside the forge in a circle, trying to find a solution to the primer problem. Then it hit her. Maybe there is some sort of magical monster drop that may help her. She remembered when she requested an extermination and drop collection quest from the guild. The guild mate said something about a magic core. Maybe that's where she'll get the answer to her primer problem. She then thought of Edwina from yesterday, who was an alchemist. Maybe she'll have some knowledge regarding magic cores. The problem is, where can she find her? She didn't know the location of her house, so this was going to be difficult. She decided that she would start at the guild and look for her from there. So she went out and encountered her sister, who had just come back from sword training. Sis, where are you going? Ellie asked as she laid down the bag she was carrying on her back. I need to find Edwina Nero replied. The alchemist from yesterday. What for? Ellie asked further. It's so I can improve my weapon, Nero replied blatantly. I see. Can I come along? I'll help you look for her. She said. Sure, it'll help with the search, Nero replied. The two went ahead and made their first stop. Inside the Redfield Guild, there were a lot of people who needed the guild services, and lucky for them, Edwina was one of them. She was currently lined up, probably to complete a quest. The twins approached her and tapped her on the shoulder. Yes. Oh. Nira. Ellie. I was just waiting for my turn to redeem this quest. Edwina said as she turned to face the twins. I see. I just needed your help with something, Nira said. Oh, and what is it? Edwina replied while she stepped backwards so she could keep up with the line. I need your help with magic cores. Nira spoke as she stepped forward to follow Edwina. What about them? Edwina asked. Are there any magic cores that would ignite by hitting it hard enough? Nira asked. Edwina thought for a moment, recalling the magic cores she experimented with. Oh. I think the doom slime core does that. I know because I've hit one with a hammer once and a small fire started. She explained, recalling the events. Why did you hit one with a hammer in the first place? Ellie asked in confusion. Ah, it's more like an incident, Tehi. I dropped a crate full of doom slime cores and the cores ignited when some were hit by the falling hammer that I ran into. She explained. I see, Nira commented. If you want, I could give some to you. I got more than enough for my experiments, she said as she moved backwards again to follow the line. That would be really helpful. Nira spoke, thankful she doesn't have to risk her life fighting explosive slimes. Just let me finish this quest, and we can head over to my house and get some. Edwina said this turned around, and found out she was at the front of the line. Here are all the health potions that were listed on the quest. She spoke and placed the basket, which contained vials of liquid. The guild maid nodded, grabbed the quest request from Edwina, and put a stamp on it. Afterwards, she handed Edwina the rewards of 40 silver coins. All right, let's head over to my place, she announced after she grabbed the coins from the counter and placed them inside a small pouch. The three walked out of the guild building and started walking northeast. They passed the streets that were stone, entering a zone close to the market. The place had different shops that sold different kinds of magical items, from armor to weapons and even potions. Edwina led the twins into a two-story building made out of wood. When they entered, they noticed that Edwina was running a small shop for potions, including mana potions, healing potions, and strength potions. The twins gazed at the different assortments of potions that Edwina had for sale. The two then noticed that Edwina was motioning for them to come follow her, so they did so. They entered a small room that had different containers for ingredients that helped her with her potions, as well as different bottles and equipment that you would find in a laboratory, like flasks and condensers. The twins watched as Edwina kneeled down and pulled out a crate that contained a lot of doom slime cores. They say cores, but they actually look more like medium-sized gems. Here you go. Remember, if you want to make it smaller, you can rub it with a grinder so it won't ignite. She explained. Nira nodded and took five out. This would do, Nira said. Consider this as thanks for saving me from that bear yesterday, Edwina said with a smile. 38. Chapter 16. Cartridges. After some small talk with Edwina, Nira and Ellie left her house as the sun was coming down. The twins backtracked their way to the guild and, from there, walked home. When they arrived, the twins noticed that the air smelled like cooked fish. Their mother must be cooking in the kitchen. 
Ellie went ahead and went to the kitchen while Nira opened the doors to the forge. The forge was almost the same as she first saw it, the only issue is that without their dad, the forge is to remain closed for the day. Nevertheless, Nira still walked towards the crafting bench and placed the bag of doom slime cores on the table before her. She took a look at the gems and slowly walked towards the anvil to see how much of a reaction it would have if she struck the core with a hammer. So she set up a rope system that would drop the hammer onto the anvil without her getting too close to the core when it eventually combusted. Nira then placed the shield between her and the anvil and let go of the rope. When the hammer hit the core, flames suddenly burst out like a mini explosion. Not big enough to destroy the forge, but hot enough that it would ignite the gunpowder. The only problem now is that the cores are too big for them to fit into a cartridge. So, she remembered Edwina's recommendation and started sanding them down into a small disc shape. The finger-sized stone became a small disc. She then grabbed some parchment and cut it to the right size. With it finished, Nira then wrapped the piece of parchment around the doom slime core that had been grinded and glued it tight. What she has now is a casing, and she then put some gunpowder inside the cylinder that was made by the parchment. Next is the projectile. She knew she needed a better shape for the projectile, so she grabbed a piece of clay and started slowly manipulating it into a mold complete with the grooves needed for the projectile to spin as it leaves the barrel. Then she placed the mold near the furnace so it would harden. After it did so, she took it out and placed it on the anvil. Then she took out the molten lead and poured it into the mold she had made. The liquid metal immediately took the form of a bullet, and Nero was satisfied with the results. After it hardened, Nira took the bullet and inspected it for any deformities. After she was satisfied, she placed some cotton on top of the gunpowder and placed the projectile on the cotton. She then pressed the rim of the parchment cartridge for a tight fit and for the entire cartridge to be snug without any space. She was now done, and she could use this to measure the caliber of the revolver she wanted to make. Of course, she made about seven more and will test one tomorrow to see if it will work. Right now, it was late in the night and everyone in the house was asleep. As Nira stepped into the kitchen, she noticed that her mom and sister had left her some food to eat after she was done with the upgrades to her weapon. Nira smiled as she sat down and started eating. When she was done, she went ahead and took a shower in the bathroom and went to her and Ellie's room. Nira and Ellie now had separate beds that hugged either side of the wall. Nira's bed was to the right, so she moved over there and noticed that her sister was already asleep. She then patted her sister's hair and whispered, Thanks for saving me some. Ellie smiled as she finished her words, and Nira proceeded to sleep on her bed. She woke up the next morning and noticed that her sister was gone. She did work late into the night to finish the cartridge, so it was understandable. She fixed her hair, wore her clothes, and proceeded down the stairs to see that her mother was in the kitchen waiting for her while she did the dishes. Good morning, Nira, Mayabel said as she was cleaning the plates. Good morning, Mom. Nira replied. Where's Ellie? She asked. In the forge, dear, she said something about making a better sword. Mabel replied. Okay, I'll go see her, Nira said, and she slowly walked towards the forge. After she opened the door, she noticed that her sister was hammering away at a piece of heated steel. She noticed that the steel was about to break because it was too cold and tried to warn her sister, but it was too late. The moment Ellie struck the steel again, it broke in two. No. That's the third time already. Ellie said in frustration. Hey Ellie, Nira said, announcing her presence to her sister. Oh, hey, sis, Ellie greeted back. What are you trying to make? Nira asked. Just a new sword, but the steel keeps breaking on me. Ellie replied. That's high carbon steel you're using. No wonder it broke. It was too cold. Nira said as she was inspecting the broken steel rod. Oh, I didn't notice till now, Ellie replied, defeated. Here, let me help you. Nira said as she picked up a hammer and started heating up a high carbon steel ingot. The difference between high carbon and low carbon steel is that high carbon steel is stronger and harder, but it's really stiff and prone to snapping into two pieces when it's too cold, while low carbon steel just bends when applied force. Nira said as she placed the heated steel ingot inside the furnace. Just take your time with high carbon steel, and eventually it'll follow through as you whack its shape with the hammer. Nira explained as she started hammering at the steel. After a couple of minutes of reheating and hammering, she now has the desired blade shape that Ellie was looking for. Here, you can quench it now, she said as he placed the blade into the furnace, and Ellie came in with her own steel pincers and grabbed the heated blade and immediately dropped it into some waiting oil. 
After she pulled it out, Ellie tested its quality and was surprised at how good it was. Thanks for the help, Nira, Ellie said with a smile. No problem, Nira replied. As the two were minding their own business, bells started ringing frantically outside the forge. Nira and Ellie rushed out to see what the problem was, and they heard someone shout. Monsters horde! Every adventurer, proceed to the guild now! 37. Chapter 17. The Horde PT1. The twins rushed inside to get armed. Nira grabbed her musket and flintlock that were on the table. She also wore the bandolier that carried gunpowder vials and attached the bag full of lead balls for her weapons to her waist. Nira rushed back outside just as Ellie came up behind her. She had her trusty red and black tinted sword with her, along with the sword breaker she always carries. The twins then rushed to the adventure guild. They dodged multiple people that were panicking to either get out of tune before the horde arrives or hunker down and barricade their homes. The two met Edwina along the way, who was already wearing her little utility belt full of potions. Once they arrived at the front of the guild, they noticed a large group of adventurers that were huddled up in front of the guild. They could also see an elevated platform to which an old but muscular man can be seen. He was shirtless but had two giant axes behind his back. He also wore what looked like riped pants along with brown boots. He also wore wristbands that had small spikes on them. Listen up, all of you, he shouted in a commanding tone. The monster horde could be here in the next 30 minutes. I want every available adventurer to be able to defend this town, at least until reinforcements from Ares come to assist. Forward Scout said that the horde consists of orcs, goblins, and wyverns. For now, archers, stand on the wall to shoot down the wyverns. Some will provide cover on the ground. Assassins, take any stragglers that try to escape. Swordsmen, take the front line along with the berserkers. Mags will stand behind the swordsmen to provide support. Healers and alchemists will be behind the archers on the ground. Any questions? He yelled out and explained. One raised her hand. She looked like a typical healer with the white cloak that had golden trims. Where are they going to be coming from? She asked. From the east side of the city. If you all don't have any more questions, you can start moving now, he shouted. Everyone, including the twins and Edwina, marched towards the eastern entrance to the town. Nera opted to be on the ground along with the other archers that were to provide support to the mag swordsmen and berserkers up in front. Nera took her position to protect Edwina, she also has a clear line of sight into the soon-to-be kill zone. She also had a short enough distance to provide Ellie with any kind of support if needed. This was bad timing though. This kind of battle requires a weapon that can be reloaded quickly, or have multiple shots loaded. For now she has to rely on the frontliners to protect her while she was reloading. TSK, you shouldn't be out here, girl. A person said beside her. Excuse me, Nira replied, turning to face an elf. Nira knew because of the pointed ears. The female elf had short blonde hair, her bangs covered her left eye, and she wore traditional archery clothes. A white shirt with a quiver behind her as well as a green cape that had a hood. You heard me, you don't even have a bow or quiver. Are you even an archer? She said with audible disgust in her voice. You should have stayed inside the walls along with that strange tube thing you have. She added. Their conversation was cut short by the thundering sound of hundreds of footsteps approaching their position. The swordsmen, berserkers, and mags are ready. Archers pulled back their bow with an arrow loaded along with the elf girl while still staring down at Nira. The berserkers charged in first, and with their broad swords and humongous strength, they easily ripped the first wave of goblins to shreds. But then the orcs came which halted the berserkers' slaughter because of their thick skin. The swordsmen and mags now come in as support and they helped each other by outmaneuvering or casting magic to bypass the thick skin armor that orcs possess. The archers on the wall started raining down arrows to weaken incoming waves by dulling their numbers down to be less of a burden at the front. Nira knew she still had some range over the archer, so she took aim with her musket at the target, the head of an orc. She estimated the range was about 90 to 100 meters and compensated notching her gun a bit to the left to account for the inaccuracy of her unrifled firearm. When she pressed the trigger, sparks flew into the waiting gunpowder on the flashpan as smoke billowed out of the flintlock mechanism almost covering Nira in a thick reddened smoke. The lead ball that came out of it outmatched the speed of the arrows that were being flown around. The ball hit the orc straight in the eye as the elf that belittled her from earlier looked in shock. What was that? Did she kill that giant thing with one shot? That can't be possible. She thought while she stared at the corpse of the dead orc for a few seconds before she turned back to see Nira. 
The girl looked like she was a mage with the smoke clearing out, but they all knew she was fighting under the archer class. She stared at Nira wide-eyed and surprised as the latter grabbed a vial from her bandolier and poured its contents into her strange and dangerous weapon. You're right, I'm not an archer, she said as she loaded another lead ball into the barrel while she stared at the elf girl. I'm a ranger, Nira, with a complacent smile plastered on her face, used the ramrod on her musket. After it was done, she fired off another shot that was aimed at the goblin that was about to attack her sister. 38. Chapter 18. The Horde PT2. As the battle raged on, eventually everyone started to feel a bit tired. Wave after wave of enemies came to attack the town but got repelled immediately afterwards. Nira was down to her last three balls of ammunition for her musket. If she used them up now she would have to get closer to use her flintlock. The horde was still very capable, and everyone was getting pretty tired. Alchemist now moved in to replenish the strength of the front line as well as their archer protectors whilst waiting for the next wave to arrive. Edwina ran up to Nira, the latter was using her musket as an aid for her to stand up. Here, drink this, she said while she got a bottle filled with a dimly glowing green liquid. What's that? Nira asked as she grabbed the bottle and opened the cork. It's an energy restoration potion. It'll help replenish your energy Edwina then helped her up as Nira drank the potion. Nira noted the test was bitter, but nevertheless she felt more energized than she did a few seconds ago. She loaded another round into her musket and cocked the action. Listen up, the old muscular man from earlier shouted. The next one is the last wave, according to our scouts. Give it everything you got. He then went back to the front lines to await the last wave. Nira got ready and kneeled down beside Edwina. She aimed her musket at the direction where the final wave will come and she'll be damn sure she isn't going to waste the last three balls of ammunition left. She can see Ellie near her position, her blade was covered in blood along with the armor she was wearing. Ellie noticed that Nira was looking at her worriedly so she gave her twin sister a thumbs up signaling that she's fine and ready for face the final wave. Here they come. The guy from earlier shouted as the battlefield was filled with the thunderous sound of the last wave. The fight soon turned into a melee as the number of goblins from earlier was more than the current wave they were fighting but had more orcs than the previous waves. She then spotted a goblin that was about to attack her sister, who was busy outmaneuvering an orc. Nira pointed her weapon to the goblin and fired. She managed to hit it in the leg thanks to the inaccurate nature of non-rifled firearms. The goblin just limped towards her sister aiming to scratch her with its small claws. She tried to reload as fast as she could but the nature of flinlock firearms didn't allow her to load it in time. In the end, Ellie was able to see the goblin and maneuver herself to decapitate it with one sword swing at its head. Nira needed a firearm that can carry multiple shots of ammunition because the reload time of a musket was its biggest weakness. She was thinking for a brief period that she she didn't saw the goblin that was flanking her. Nira. She hit her sister shout as the goblin was able to lunge at her. She closed her eyes preparing to receive the blow but was surprised that she hadn't been injured. When she opened her eyes, the goblin was on the ground impaled by a spear. When she gazed at the position where Eeth Soya could have come from, she saw a man wearing some heavy looking armor. He didn't have a helmet so Nira was able to see his appearance. Short black hair with brown eyes. Judging by his looks, Nira thought that he must be a high-ranking knight due to the decorations on his armor. The man walked past Nira and retrieved his spear from the corpse of the dead goblin. He retrieved it with blood splattered on the ground near the dead goblin. Watch yourself, girl. He turned to Nira and gave her a stern look. T thanks, Nira said as she stood up from the ground as she grabbed her musket. Captain Phillips, thank the lord you have arrived, the guild master from earlier said as he approached him. My knights will support the front lines. Let's push them back one last time knights from the gate of the town started pulling out into the battlefield. Within minutes, with help from knights, the adventurers managed to repel the last wave of monsters as assassins took out any stragglers that were still visible. Everyone cheered and raised their weapons high to signify victory. Captain Phillips though was staring at Nira, specifically her weapon. What an interesting piece of equipment. He thought as he remembered the shot she took at the goblin that was aiming at her sister. Nira was with Ellie, and the twins smiled in happiness as they noticed that neither of them were injured in the battle. That was amazing, sis, the way you killed some of them with just one shot was spectacular, Ellie said while she cleaned her sword from the blood before sheathing it into the scabbard on her waist. Yeah, but take a shower first after we get home, Nira commented to her sister, who was covered in monster blood. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it, Ellie replied while she rolled her eyes. 
The two was then caught by a slight tackle by their resident alchemist. That was a really good show, you two. That weapon, along with Nira, was so deadly, and Ellie, with her sword, tore into those orcs like a butcher, Edwina commented. Yeah, but this weapon needs more upgrades, Nira said while she hellayed her flintlock in front of her. What's wrong with it? Edwina asked as she looked over Nira's shoulder. Nothing, it's just that Ellie and I almost got killed because I wasn't able to reload in time, Nira said. Don't worry, sis, we're still alive, and I'm sure you'll find a solution to that issue, Ellie said. Yeah, I do already have something in mind, Nira said with a smirk. 40. Chapter 19. Aftermath and Discussion. After the party over at the Adventurers Guild, everyone got awarded based on how much they killed, the type of monster they killed, and the aid they gave the frontliners. Nira was responsible for five orcs, seventeen goblins, and, surprising enough, one wyvern. She managed to shoot one down when she saw it flying towards the wall to attack the town so she was awarded 47 silver coins. Ellie was responsible for 10 orcs and 15 goblins and was awarded 54 silver coins, and Edwina received 50 silver coins for her aid with the frontline adventurers. On their way out, they were intercepted by the elf that had belittled Nira earlier for her strange weapon. Hey! I just want to apologize for how I acted earlier, she said as she got close to their group. I expected elves to be proud of their archery, but what you did earlier was beyond my expectations, Nira said. I know. I just want to apologize, since judging you by your weapon alone was unjust. She said, just keep that prideful nature of elves to a minimum, and I'll forgive you, Nira replied. Thank you, what's your name, by the way? She said, Nira, and yours? Nira replied, my own Nirarun, but you can call me Marie, she said. All right, Marie, apology accepted. Nira announced as the elf sighed in relief. Say, how does your weapon work? Is it magic? Murray asked. Hey, I want to know too. Edwina jumped in, keen to know its secrets. No, it's not magic. It's actually more closely related to your bow than magic, Nira answered. Murray then scratched her chin. How so? Murray noticed that Edwina already had her notebook and quill out to record. It uses materials that I have to propel a small piece of lead forward. She said this as Edwina started to take notes. I see. Marie nodded. While the girls were chatting near the entrance of the guild, the guildmaster was in his office when a guildmaid walked in. Guildmaster Victor, Captain Phillips is waiting for you, she said. Let him in. The guildmaid bowed and exited the room. Later on, Captain Phillips of the Knight Regiment sent to aid their battle entered the room. Good evening, guildmaster, he said. Gold evening, captain. Please take a seat. Victor motioned for him to sit in one of the chairs that were adjacent to his table. Captain Phillips nodded and sat down. I am sure you are aware that these kinds of hordes only happen when someone or something pushed them out of the eastern forest, Phillips said as he sat down with a map on the guildmaster's table. I am aware. The only question is, what drove them out of the forest? If it was that many that came out, then there is a high likelihood that the thing responsible is extremely dangerous and powerful, Victor said. Yes, this could be a big situation. At worst, it could be a Lord Class Dragon, Phillips said, pointing at the mountain range near the forest. If it is, it could be nested up right here. We're not certain, but I will contact the guild leader to see if he could dispatch an S-ranker to deal with this issue, Victor said. For now, all we can do is run scout teams to see if they can spot anything. There are already quests posted on the quest board for anyone who wants to volunteer, Victor added. All right then. My men will be aiding the town's defenders in patrols, Phillips said. Now that all the formal things are out of the way, how's your life in the capital, Phil? Victor said he was changing his attitude. Really boring, if I have to say. The wife always hounds me, saying that I'm cheating on her. Plus, I can't do any quests like we used to since I'm not an adventurer anymore, he added with a depressed expression. I told you, you shouldn't have accepted the invitation to the Knight Academy. Rose. A guild maid peered out from the door. Yes guildmaster, she said. Can you fetch us a drink from downstairs? He asked as the maid nodded and left. Oh yeah, did you see that strange girl earlier? Philip said he was thinking about the girl who had that sharp weapon with her. Yeah, are you asking this so you can cheat on your wife? You're trying to find someone to cheat with. Victor said it in a sarcastic way. What? No. I would never cheat on her with another woman. He shouted. Ha ha ha, I'm just messing with you, yes, 
I did notice her using that weapon of hers, Victor said, smiling. That weapon was weird. It can easily one-shot creatures that take a few arrows to kill. What does her profile say about her? Phillips said. Let me get the files, he said as he bent down and opened a drawer in his desk. Let me see. Aha! Here she is, he said while pulling a piece of parchment from the drawer. So, her name is Nira Augustine, age 18. She lives with a twin along with her parents, and her class is Archer? Philip said as he read through Nira's bio. I've never seen an archer field that weapon. Victor commented. It says here she's a rank D adventurer, Philip said of her rank. Yeah, I guess she's relatively new. She's also one quest away from taking the archer rank up test, Victor said as Phillips nodded and gave him back the document. Victor grabbed it and put it back inside the drawer. I think we should keep an eye on her. She may do some interesting things in the future, Phillips recommended as Victor nodded. Agreed. Here's your drink, Guildmaster, Captain. The maid from earlier entered the office with two large mugs of beer. Thank you, Rose, Victor said as he grabbed the mugs and gave one to Phillips. The guild made known as Rose bowed and exited the office later on. Cheers to our victory, Victor said as he raised his mug. Cheers. Phillips then bumped his mug, and the two started drinking and chatting into the night. 36. Chapter 20. Being a good sister. After the twins said their goodbyes to Edwina and Marie, they arrived home to see that their parents were waiting for them. See me Abel, I told you they were fine. He turned to his wife, and the latter rushed forward to check every square inch of their children. Ouch. Mom. Stop, we're okay. Ellie said as she kept her eyes on me Abel. Yeah, Mom, we're okay. Nira added. Me Abel breathed a sigh of relief after she checked on her daughters. It does seem you two are alright, she said. So how'd it go? Marcus said as he walked up to his daughters. Pretty good, me and Nira dispatched a ton of them and even got a lot of silver in doing so. Ellie answered as she and Nira pulled out their coin purses and reveled to have a lot of silver inside. Well, congrats to you two. Me and your mother just hid in the basement. Your mother here kept panicking that you two would die out there, he said while whispering the last part. Now that's over with, let's eat dinner. Me Abel announced this as the group entered the dining room to eat. After dinner, her parents and sister retired to bed. Nira, though, went ahead and excused herself to work inside the forge. While inside, she made a few more charts about eleven more so she could start pondering how she would make the entirety of the revolver pistol. While thinking of a way to bend the steel into something that would help her make the revolver, she got a glimpse of Ellie's sword, which was full of cracks and was about to break at any minute. Nira grabbed the sword and inspected it, and true to her, she thought it was about to break. Oh, Ellie, still struggling with the maintenance of this thing. Nira said as she looked around the forge to find the blade she and Ellie forged earlier. This should do, she said, and she grabbed the blade. The sword was practically ready, it just needed a handle and a scabbard. So Nira took the liberty to start making it for her sister. First, she forged a handguard using four pieces of steel rod. She then went around and attached a ring of steel to the rods that formed a circle. She then grabbed a piece of wood from the pile and started carving it using the tools on the crafting table. She slowly chipped away the wood until she had two rectangular parts that had a notch inside to fit the blade. Then, she placed the rectangle blade end into the notch and covered it in wood glue. She then used a clamp to hold it together while the glue dried. As the glue was drying, she grabbed a longer, rectangular piece of wooden plank and started measuring the dimensions of the blade. The sword itself was interesting. It was a long sword, but not exactly long, and it's not exactly a short sword either, it's somewhere in the middle. After she took notes of the measurements, she started carving it into a cylinder, after which she split it in two. She then carved the notches that fit the blade inside the scabbard on one half and did the same with the other half. Then, after she noticed that the glue had dried on the handle, she used the grinder wheel to slowly grind it into a cylinder shape. She then painted it using Ellie's favorite color, which was red. She used black paint as a primer and layered red paint on the handle with black spots to complement the red. After it was dry, she used the black paint on the scabbard. She then pulled out the sword from its scabbard and checked for any deformities to which she found none. Next, she inspected the sword and was satisfied with how it turned out. She then placed the sword, with its scabbard, on the crafting table. Ah, finally done. Ellie owes me big time for this, Nira said, dozing off to sleep with her head on the crafting table. As morning came, Ellie noticed that her sister was not in their room together. Maybe she woke up early and went to work inside the forge. 
So she sat up, got dressed, and went downstairs to the forge. Inside, she found Nira, who was sleeping on the crafting table with a sword in front of her. Ellie then picked up the sword and inspected it. She also pulled it out and noticed something with the blade. Isn't this the blade we forged yesterday before the monster horde attacked? She actually finished it. Ellie looked at the blade and back at her sister. She then smiled and patted the sleeping Nira on the back. Thanks Nira. She said. 36. Chapter 21. The gunsmith needs help with magic. Nira woke up later and rubbed her eyes as she rose from her seat. She noticed the sword she finished was not within her grasp and concluded that her sister must have taken it while she was asleep. She stretched her arms as she stood up from her seat and walked towards the exit. She accidentally bumped into a shelf due to morning drowsiness, which caused a book to drop to the ground. She kneeled down to pick up the book and managed to get a glimpse of its title. Magical Arts Volume 1 Foot Nira then thought that if she could fully utilize her magical abilities, then she would be crafting weapons at peak efficiency. Frost can be used to cool down metals so they can be immediately quenched without the use of oil. Lightning can be used to make a basic electric motor that uses wood and copper. With it, she could engineer a steel milling machine that could do the precise cutting action she needed for fully automatic or semi-automatic weapons. Darkness, though, needed more information about the abilities that it could possess. So she hoped sometime in the future she could visit the Great Library in the capital so she could get more information about it. She then decided to learn the basics of magic today, so she took a shower, ate a meal with her parents and sister, and went ahead to find an arcane mage in the city. Or, oh, then she got a better idea, she went to the adventurer's guild instead. While inside, the guild was as lively as ever. She walked towards the front desk to register a quest. Welcome to the Redfield Guild, adventurer. What can I help you with today? The guild maid at the front desk asked in a polite manner. Can I register a quest even though I'm an adventurer? Nira asked. You can, as long as you're not under a quest at this very hour. The guild maid answered. So, please give me your guild identification card so I may verify if you are not on a quest, she added. Nira pulled out her now copper card and gave it to the guild maid. The maid then used magic as she scanned over it with her hand and gave it back to Nira afterwards. It does not appear you have any active quests right now, so what do you want to request? She said. I would like a mage from the guild to teach me some magic. Nira explained. The maid nodded and started scribbling notes on a piece of parchment with a quill. Is that all? She asked. Yes, Nira replied. That'll be 20 silver coins, a guild fee, and rewards for the adventurers added. She said. Nira nodded and placed down the exact number of silver coins for the guild maid. The catter took it, placed it under the desk, and stamped the parchment with the guild's crest. She then walked out of her position to nail it to the quest board. Is it okay if I wait here for anyone to pick up the quest? Nira said. Yes, of course. The maid nodded and replied. Nira walked towards the nearest chair and sat down. A few minutes turned into a few hours, and no one has picked up the quest yet. She even bought lunch there at the guild. Then, as she was ready to ask the guild maid to point out the adventures at her home, she prepared to head over there. She spots a group of four adventurers looking at the board. Hey Hildia, look, a quest just for teaching another adventurer some magic, the tall man with the heavy looking armor said. Huh? The smaller woman, whom Nira assumed to be Hildia, noticed it and took a look. Yeah, Hildia, this is an easy 18 silver coins. The other man said, I guess I could try she said. Hey, if this goes well, I'll buy you some juice from the guild bar if you want. The blonde elf beside her said. Okay, let's do it, Hildia said as she tore the parchment from the quest board and walked towards the front desk. Adventurer's Guild. I like the term PMC better. Nira thought of the private military corporations that would work for the right pay. The maid then pointed at Nira, so the group approached where she was sitting. Whoa. She's going to be the one you're teaching. Luki. She heard the man, who seemed to be the leader, comment. Nira paid no heed as the elf girl elbowed him to the side for his comment. The first to step forward was Hildia, and she introduced herself to Nira. Hello, my name is Hildia, and I'm the one who's going to teach you about magic. She said this while she held her staff. Okay, my name is Nira, I'm an adventurer like all of you, she said with a comforting smile. Who's the other three in your party? Nira asked. Oh oh right, this is Gareth our phalanx and front line. She said this as she motioned to the man wearing the heavy looking armor. Greetings, he said in a low but audible voice. This is Shale, our archer, she said as she motioned to the blonde-haired elf. 
Pleasure to make your acquaintance, she said. And this is Eric, our swordsman and leader. She said she motioned to the guy wearing light armor with a sword by his side. What time are you free? He said a bit as she finished. Shale elbowed him to the side, which made him wince in pain. I mean. Nice to meet you, beautiful, he said as he whispered the last part under his breath. Nice to meet you all, I'm Nira. An archer keen to learn about the arcane arts, Nira said. Now that introductions are out of the way, let's head outside the city to begin the lessons, Gareth said in a stern manner. They nodded as they left the adventurer's guild and walked outside the walls that protected the city and its inhabitants. 36. Chapter 22. Magic. The group eventually picked a good-looking place to train Nira in the arts of magic outside the town walls. The two men of the group had collected some stones earlier and used them to grow a pile that would serve as their targets for their spells. Okay, where to begin? Hildia spoke as she sat down and crossed her legs. She then motioned for Nira to follow suit, and the latter agreed and sat down on the grass in front of Hildia. To first use magic, you need elemental mana, which is the energy that created and shaped our world, to reach a certain threshold. It's the first step all of us mags must make to harness this energy, Hildia said. She lost her aloft and shy personality when she started explaining. Just close your eyes and focus on a point inside your chest. If it starts to feel uncomfortable, just continue. It just means that the mana is close to reaching the breakthrough it needs to manifest outside your physical body. She explained. Nira obliged and closed her eyes. She started focusing on the three spell affinities she was compatible with, which were frost, lightning, and darkness. For the first few seconds, nothing happened. She just saw complete darkness inside her closed eyelids. She concentrated more for a couple of minutes until, suddenly, she started to feel the uncomfortable feeling that Hildia mentioned. She tried to ignore the pain but kept going. That's it, Nira. Keep going, yelled Hildia's voice from a distance. Outside, Hildia had distanced herself because of what was happening. Small arcs of lightning cracked around her body as a layer of ice formed under her feet. The strangest thing for Hildia, however, was that dark spheres that floated around Nira, which left her in awe. That could only have meant one thing. She has an affinity for darkness magic. She said it in a low voice, which her party members heard. What? Isn't that, like, really rare? Eric yelled as Shale elbowed him hard in the stomach. S-H-H-H-H, she said. Yes, only one in ten thousand had been blessed with darkness-compatible magic. She answered. I see, Gareth said as he looked at Nira, who was still concentrating hard to get her mana to reach that threshold. Nira had been experiencing pain in her chest for quite a while now. It felt like ages, but in reality, it's only been a couple of seconds. She then started to imagine three spheres of light that were trapped within herself. One black, one bluish white and one yellow. She kept at it until something finally clicked. The spears left her body like an erupting volcano and started to circle her. Nira finally felt the pain dissipate and relief coursed throughout her mind. She noticed that the spheres circled with great speeds as her brain checked her out of her mind's cape. Back outside, a small shockwave emerged from where Nira was located. It melted the ice that formed under her feet and dissipated the lightning and dark orbs that surrounded her. When Nira opened her eyes, the first thing she noticed was that everyone was a fair bit away from her. Did something happen while she was trying to get the elemental mana to reach its threshold? You did it, Nira. Hildia congratulated her as she ran up to Nira with a big, proud smile plastered on her face. Nira smiled too, due to her accomplishment. What's next? She asked as Hildia nodded and motioned for her to approach the four piles of rocks they have as target practice. Now, it makes things a whole lot easier. Hildia said, to cast a spell, you have to think about what element that spell would use and the outcome of it. It helps if you yell out the name of the spell, and remember to always be confident that your spell would hit the mark, like this. She said this as she opened her hands and aimed at the rock pile. Fireball. A ball of flame manifested out of her hands and traveled across the small distance to hit the rock pile. Once it impacted, the entire pile exploded. See? That easy. She put her hands on her hips and wore a big smile. All of this seemed so weird to Nira, especially the saying the name to cast the spell part. She wasn't a big fan of novels, especially fantasy ones. She's only ever read the history of firearms. Nevertheless, she brushed those feelings aside and walked to face the other rock pile that was waiting for her. She then opened her hand and aimed it at the pile of rocks, just like Hildia did. She thought of the element she would use and shouted, I spikes. 
A dozen or so spikes made out of ice suddenly came out of her hand and traveled to hit the stone pile. Once it did, it wasn't as big of a damage as Hildia's fireball, but it still did the damage. Very good. You catch them quick. Now try your other two elements on those last two piles. Nira nodded and did the same to the other rock pile. Only this time she would use her lightning affinity magic. Lightning arc. She shouted. Lightning shot out from her hand and instantly impacted the rocks. All of the rocks were pulverized by the electricity. Good. Now for the last one, Hildia said a bit hesitantly. Nira did it again, but this time she said the name of the spell. Darkness pulse. She shouted, but to her dismay. Nothing came out of the spell she casted. I knew it would be hard for you to harness the darkness attribute spell. I recommend you go to the great library inside the capital for information about this attribute because you're the first person I met with the darkness attribute, and I have no knowledge about it. Hildia said. Nira sighed and walked up to Hildia. The rest of Hildia's party approached them. That was spectacular, Nira. You're really a fast learner, Shale said. Yes, I agree with Shale. What you did usually takes years to master, Gareth commented. So now that you're free. Kanyo Eric was then cut off by Shale stepping on his foot. He then winced in pain while he held his injury. Thank you for teaching me, Hildia, and thank you guys for helping, Nira said. Gareth smirked, and Shale smiled. As for Eric, his face was still in pain from what Shale had done to him earlier. As for Hildia, she wore a proud smile. The group then went back to the Adventurers Guild as the sun was setting. Hildia's party then picked up the rewards from the quest Nira had commissioned. Outside, Nira had noticed that they were already prepared to leave the city. Where are you guys going? Nira said. To Ares, we have to go there to get an escort quest to the capital, Gareth explained. Okay, good luck on the journey, Nira said, and thanks again for the help. Nira added and turned to Hildia. And no problem. Just go look for us if you need any more, Hildia said. The group then waved goodbye to Nira as they left for the city of Ares. As for Nira, she returned home, eager to experiment with the new things she had learned today. 34. Chapter 23. Big Step. As soon as Nira returned home, she got straight to work on a groundbreaking invention that would change the world if she shared its secrets. The electric motor. If she were able to make a basic and functional electric motor, then manufacturing firearms would be a whole lot easier especially when she can just drill solid steel rods to make a barrel and use the drill to start milling steel blocks to shape them into more complex parts for self-loading firearms. Nira only has the basic knowledge of how an electric motor works due to the times that the steel milling machine she used extensively in her past life broke and she had to fix it on her own. Nira got to work and started scribbling down plans. She already has the power supply, which is lightning magic. The electric motor works on the principles of electromagnets, which turn ordinary metals like copper into working magnets by using electricity, and that opposite poles of a magnet attract while the same poles oppose one another. With a bit of thinking and head scratching later, she deduced that she needed two curved pieces of lodestone that would act as the stator, which is the part of the electric motor that stays still, while the rotor, which comprises several copper rods, would spin using an electric circuit by means of lightning magic. First were the pieces where the copper bar would be bent around, called the armature. The armature, when electricity is fed through it, would become an electromagnet. So she needed a casing that would help shape the copper bar, made out of a material that does not let electricity pass through. Her eyes had fallen upon the wood storage as an idea popped into her head. She remembered that wood is a natural insulator and would help keep the rods from touching each other and keep them in shape. Obviously, it's not as ideal as something like aluminum, but in her mind, it should work. She grabbed a piece of wood and started carving it into the shape that she wanted. After she was done, the wooden piece looked like a very thick cylindrical cogwheel with 20 teeth about the size of her hand. Next, she grabbed two pieces of lodestone and measured where their north and south poles were located. She then used the grindstone to grind down the pieces she had into two curved pieces, which were a bit larger than the wooden piece she made, leaving a small gap so that the stator and rotor would not make contact. Next, she prepared to cast the remaining parts she needed. This included the commentator, which will transmit electricity from her hands directly into the copper bar and switch the poles of the electromagnet to keep it spinning. The commutator looks like a smaller version of the armature, but it's made out of copper sheets that are curved outward. She used clay to mold the pieces and set them to dry in the furnace. Next were the copper bars that would produce the electromagnet needed to rotate the armature, 
or rotor. She just used a piece of wood shaped like a boxy U. She made 10 of these and measured them so they would fit snugly with the armature. The last component she needed was the brushes that would make contact with the commutator, which would make electricity flow through it and into the armature. She used a small chip of wood to cast it and will assemble it further later using a small case and springs. Once done, she placed it inside a box, filled it with sand, and started melting copper. After the copper melted, she took out the molds for the components and left the cavity open. Then she poured in the molten copper and waited for it to cool. Once cooled, she sanded down the components so that they would fit tightly with one another and gathered all the things required for final assembly. First, she inserted the copper U-shaped bars around the spaces of the stator. Then she attached the commutator to the armature by sliding a metal bar through the center of the entire motor. She then fixed the two pieces of the stator to a wooden base using nails and then mounted the rotor assembly between the two halves of the stator and side in relief. That her measurements were correct and left a small bit of space between the stator and the rotor. Finally, she completed the brushes by adding a small spring to them she then attached them in a way so that they would be in contact with the commutator. Nira's improvised and crudely made electric motor was now finished, now all she needed to do was test it by feeding electricity into the brushes. Please work. She mumbled and prayed that it would work. She then made final checks to see if everything that she did was correct and touched the two brushes with her fingers and channeled a small amount of lightning mana into them. Her heart sank when the rotor didn't spin, and she started to feel anxious as she pumped a bit more lightning mana into it, but still it would not spin. Nira examined it while still touching the two brushes and noticed that the brushes were in contact with four of the curved copper sheets, which meant two electric magnets were being made, which in turn contradicted one another and prevented the rotor from spinning. So, she briefly took her finger off one of the brushes and rotated the commutator slowly so that only two of the sheets were in contact with the brushes. Her hand went back to its original position and started flowing lightning mana back into the system. Her eyes widened as she heard a low hum and the rotor started spinning at an estimated 100 rpm. As she added more mana, it started to go faster and topped off at 1500 rpm. More than enough for her needs of steel milling and bore drilling. The design may be crude, but an electric motor spins faster based on how much electricity is fed into it. With lightning magic, and if she had the right materials, she would have an electric motor spinning at 6000 rotations per minute. She let her fingers out of it and jumped in joy as her crudely made electric motor came to life. Now she just needed to forge the drill bits so she could get to work on the single action revolver. 38. Chapter 24. Drills and Rifling. To make the drill bit for the electric motor, she would have to use the electric motor to rotate a high carbon steel rod and slowly carve out the helical shape of the usual drill. So to start, she needed a way to attach the high carbon steel rod that would become the drill bit. She got an idea when she looked at her hand. Lightning magic. She remembered that lightning can be hot enough to melt steel. She would need to put a lot of mana into a tiny point so that the small lightning that she would use would last long enough to weld the steel rod to the rotating rod. She followed through with it and grabbed the steel rod she needed from the pile. She then sat down, facing the electric motor she had made, and placed the steel rod in contact with the rotating rod. She then closed her eyes and focused on a singular point on her finger. When she opened them, small arcs of lightning flew out of her hand and should be bright enough to weld the two rods together. She then smirked and put her finger near the point where she needed the two metals to partially melt. The arcs of lightning found their target and immediately started to superheat the steel. Said steel started to partially melt and began to stick to the two rods. Nira concentrated more as she started moving her finger around the edge of the two rods. As she moved, the lightning on her finger moved with her around the boundary between the two rods, and left nothing but red, hot, partially melted steel. When she finished, she wiped the sweat from her forehead and took a look at her work. The weld wasn't perfect and had some rough edges, but she was sure it would work by placing pressure on it. She then sat down on the floor, exhausted after using a lot of her elemental mana to power that improvised welding torch. After a few minutes, she grabbed the chisels used in carving wood and sharpened them on the grinding wheel. Then, she used more copper bars to connect the two points so that only one of her feet would be touching them while she used the other hand to mill the steel into the shape of a drill bit. She then removed her boots and socks and touched the copper rod below the desk. She then channeled lightning magic into her feet as the electric motor started spitting out the steel rod. She tested it out first by using the chisel tip to cut off a section of the rod as it rotated. 
After grinding the steel into the chisel while it rotated, a small bit got cut off in the shape of a disc. Satisfied, she began to carve out the helical shape of the drill bit by tilting the chisel to the side and slowly moving up so that it would form a helical cavity inside the rod. After a few minutes of doing exactly that, she was left with a very nice looking drill bit. Shen then sliced it off of the rotating rod and inspected the finished drill bit. She nodded, as it was the right size to drill out the barrel of her firearm. She then made another two drill bits, both with different kinds of tips, to help with the milling of extra parts like the mainspring and the grips, as well as a special one to make the rifling. She then crafted a mount to fit the drills to the rotating shaft of her electric motor and mounted the drill that would bore into the steel rod and make a hole for the barrel. She grabbed some water and rigged a small mount for the steel rod that would be drilled. It had springs on it, so it would pull the steel rod towards the electric motor so that it would always be in contact with the drill bit. Nera breathed out, as she was nervous. She did all the final checks she needed and started the electric motor by means of lightning magic through her feet. She then placed a slightly bigger rod on the spring-loaded mount. She let go of the locking mechanism of the mount, and it immediately recoiled so that it would begin to drill. The whole process produced a lot of heat, so Nira constantly poured water on the drill bit. It took a while for it to drill because she wasn't using a tungsten carbide drill, which would be a lot quicker than the high-carbon steel she was using as the drill bit. After a few runs for water as well as two hours, the drill bit finally managed to break through the back part of the steel rod. Nira pulled back the mount and inspected it, she then took out the hollowed steel rod and was satisfied that she hadn't found any cracks in it. She then replaced the drill bit with the special drill bit she made to produce the rifling that would help her with the range and accuracy of her finished firearm. It had a sharp point with gear-like teeth that would mill the steel and produce the crevices that the notches in the bullet would follow to spin. After she attached the special drill bit, she then lowered the speed of the electric motor to about 100 rpm by lowering the input of lightning magic into it. After which, she unlocked the spring-loaded mechanism as the drill started to do its thing. After an hour, it was done as Nira took her food off of the trigger for the electric motor, pulled the mount back, and locked it in place. She then inspected the finished product by looking inside and confirming that the rifling was present and was almost perfect. She pumped her fist in joy as she celebrated her achievement. After which she noticed that it was already pretty late in the night. So she stored the finished rifled barrel in a drawer on the crafting table and went upstairs to find her sister already asleep. Nira smiled at her sleeping sister and took her place on the bed to end this momentous night. One step closer to that revolver, she murmured to herself before dozing off to sleep. 32. Chapter 25. Revolver. The next morning, after Nira and her family ate their breakfast, Nira immediately proceeded and excused herself. She's been really busy lately, Ellie commented. You noticed as well? Mayabel asked. Now that you mentioned it, you're right. Nira has been really busy these past few days after the monster horde that happened, Marcus said, scratching his chin. I wonder what she's up to, Mayabel said as she presented another batch of food to her daughter and husband. The two immediately scoffed down the food like it was their last meal on death row. Meanwhile, inside the forge, Nira already had her apron on, and the furnace was already hot and ready for action. She took out the board out and rifled barrel from its storage. She then scuffed up the last remaining parts she needed to finish this revolver. She even took measurements to determine the correct size and shape of the parts needed. After the barrel, there were at least 46 more individual parts she needed, so she took the liberty to slowly make a mold for each individual part using clay. But parts like the cylinder would be made by milling a thick steel rod to fit her specifications. The mainspring, a small, curved piece of steel that allows the revolver to fire off by pressing the trigger, would have to be made by carefully forging the piece using high carbon steel. The hardest part that could potentially cause difficulty is the hammer assembly. The part that will strike the firing pinball, which will transfer the energy to the doom slime core in her cartridge. Which is difficult because if she made even the slightest miscalculation, it would mean the hammer would not fire off, or it would fire off when she's not using it. It could possibly even miss the firing pinball altogether and get herself killed in a dire situation. She sets off to start her work, and the first objective was to make the frame where all the parts would be housed. To make this, she needed the help of her makeshift steel milling machine and fitted it with one of the specialized drills she crafted yesterday. She still remembered each intricate detail, including where screws would be placed and the space where parts would be housed. These include the hole where the barrel would be mounted, pins where individual parts will be placed, spaces and notches where screws will be fitted, 
as well as the hammer assembly. She also fashioned a notch where she would house the revolving cylinder. After she was done, she measured everything and concluded that each hole and notch met her desired specifications. Next, she had to use the same drill bit to make the rotating cylinder, which will store six rounds of ammunition and be revolved to a set parameter after she cocks the hammer and cycles the action. It was fairly simple because she only had to drill holes in it for the six rounds as well as a pin where it would be paired with the notch in the frame. After she finished milling the steel rod, she, of course, inspected it and measured each hole. Again, her calculations were correct, and it should be a perfect fit into the frame. She then placed the cylinder into the frame she had just made and deemed it to be a perfect fit. Now she grabbed a lot of clay and started molding parts like the trigger guard, the trigger, the hammer, the firing ball assembly, the front and back straps, the bolt, the sear, and the hand assembly. The sear was particularly important because it held the hammer and the bolt back so they would fire off when the correct pressure was applied to the trigger. It needed to be perfect, or else it could prove disastrous. Once she had them all in clay form, she placed them near the open fire of the furnace so they would harden. While it was hardening, Nero grabbed a small piece of high carbon steel and started the process of making the mainspring of the firearm. She needed to be careful because if it was too hot, the spring would bend, and if it was too cold, it would snap. She needed it to be at the right temperature before hardening it by means of quenching. Her first attempt didn't go well because the spring, when she tested it, snapped, which meant it was too cold when she quenched it. The second attempt was too hot, so it bent in a weird way. The third attempt didn't yield results, though, as the steel was again too cold and snapped under pressure. Nero was not about to give up, though, and on her fourth attempt, she finally nailed the right temperature which made the steel piece bend and return to its original position. She sighed in relief as she enjoyed her momentary rest before she went back in. She noticed the molds were ready, so she prepared the casting sand to cast individual parts as well as heated up a piece of high carbon steel. After the steel was ready, she removed the mold from the casting sand, leaving a cavity to pour the orange molten metal inside. After a few minutes of waiting, she took out each and every individual part. Her heart sank for a moment when she noticed that the sear was slightly big, but she remembered she could just grind it down with the grinding wheel, which she does until the part is to her specifications. The other parts, like the trigger, hammer mechanism, and trigger guard, were to her specifications, and she collected them along with the cylinder and the frame along with the barrel for the crafting bench. She then attached each individual component with a pin as well as washers, and some had small springs. After the whole firearm was complete, she prayed to God that everything she did was correct and checked each individual part twice. After she was sure everything was in order, she cocked the hammer back, and she heard a click, which indicated the sear had engaged with the hammer assembly and was holding it back. She then also noticed that the cylinder revolved at the perfect angle to chamber around in line with the barrel. She nodded and gently pressed the trigger. She noted the trigger was hard, which meant the sear was biting it. When she pressed it fully, the hammer slammed into the firing pinball with such speed that it would ignite the doom slime core inside the cartridge if it was loaded. It worked. Nira couldn't believe her eyes. She even wiped them just in case she was hallucinating from the heat in the forge. She cocked the action again, and the same thing happened, the cylinder revolving into the correct position. The clicking sound when the sear engaged with the hammer assembly, as well as the hammer hitting the firing ball pin precisely. It worked. She exclaimed and threw her arms up in the air in joy. 34. Chapter 26. Speed Loader. What worked, sis? Ellie said as she went inside the room to check why her sister was yelling. Oh, Ellie, it's just this new gun I made, Nira said as she tucked away her self-made steel milling machine under the crafting table. Oh? Can I see it? Ellie said while she examined the strange machine her sister was putting away. Sure. Just be sure not to drop it since I'm not done running durability tests yet. Nira then stepped to the side so Ellie could get a good look at what her sister had made. Ellie then walked towards the crafting table. She then saw a strange looking shape that she had never seen before. It looked like her little side weapon, but it had a very thick middle part, along with the strange looking cylinders made of parchment paper that were on the side. She then slowly lifted the strange device and noted that it was a little bit heavier than the other weapon she used. Is this an upgraded version of your weapon, sis? Ellie said as she turned the weapon to the other side and noted that it looked very complex. Yeah, Nero replied. With this, I can shoot six times before having to go through the long process of reloading. She added. I see, and what are those cylindrical parchment things? 
she asked. It makes reloading much easier and takes less time, Nira answered. Ellie then took note of the sharp curves and some metal shavings on the ground beneath her feet. How did you manage to get this shape? It looks so perfect, she asked as she stared at the metal shavings. Oh, I used that little machine near your foot. It takes off small parts of the metal like you would with wood, just more precisely, she answered. Ellie then bent down to see what Nira was talking about. It looked like a huge cylinder mounted on a big piece of wood with a strange attachment at one end and a central steel bar in the middle. Sis, this thing you made could revolutionize the way we make things, Ellie said as she stood back up. Yes, but I would rather not share it for fear of it getting into the wrong hands, Nira said. If they get their hands on this, there is no telling what kind of weapons they could produce with a bit of magic. Better to be safe than sorry Nira thought. I see, Ellie said as she understood the consequence of letting this technology fall into the wrong hands of greedy people. Can I see what this new weapon can do? Ellie asked again. Sure, but maybe later. I still have to do final checks on it as well as make some final adjustments. Nira answered. Ellie nodded and gently placed the revolver back on the crafting table before she faced her sister. I'll see you later, sis, Ellie said with a smile. Sure, Nira replied with a smile of her own. Ellie then left the forge as Nira made the final checks on her arm. She nodded with a smile, saying that the revolver she made seems to be very sturdy and should last a long time. She then took some measurements and started planning on making a revolver speed loader. A sort of cylindrical device that does exactly as its name would imply. It loads a revolver swiftly by loading all six rounds of ammunition at once and not one at a time. It should be really simple to make, so she grabbed a piece of steel ingot along with her makeshift electric motor and drill and fixed the steel ingot on the receiving end. With careful hands, she slowly used the electric drill to cut the steel ingot into shape. She formed a cylinder and punched six equally sized holes around the base, going through to the back of the cylinder. She then left a hole in the center from the back which she never punched out on the other side. This is where the second part would go to complete the setup. She placed it aside and went ahead and made the second part, which looked like a long rod with a button on one end, which had a circular plate each with small holes and teeth on it that mimicked the hole placement on the other, cylinder mounted on it. She combined the two together and added a spring to the bar. When she pressed on the button, the teeth went down and should have pushed the rounds inside the revolving cylinder of her weapon. She then tested it out by placing six rounds of ammunition in the speed loader. She then opened the cylinder of her firearm and pressed the speed loader against it. She then pressed the button, which deposited all six rounds inside the revolving cylinder of the revolver. Nira then pulled it away and closed the cylinder, pushing it back towards the frame of her weapon. Nira nodded in satisfaction as she went on to make five more speed loaders and load them all up with rounds of ammunition. She then opened the belt compartment she wore during combat and removed all the lead balls for her flintlock and replaced them by placing all of the speed loaders as well as her rounds of ammunition inside the compartment. She then closed it and placed the lead balls to the side so they would be recycled and melted down to make more projectiles for her cartridges. She then noticed the mess she made while she crafted the revolver and the speed loaders. So she starts cleaning. She first swept the floor to clear it of metal shavings from milling steel and melted it back down to ingots. She then tucked away her electric motor and drill under the crafting bench and organized all of the drawers she took parts from. After she was done cleaning, Ellie entered the room and whistled. This place looks new. Ellie commented. Thanks, I'm done checking my weapon. We can go out and see if it works for the first time now, Nira said as she turned to her sister with a smile. Okay, let's go. Ellie replied with a smile of her own. 33. Chapter 27. Rank Up Quest. While walking towards the front door, Ellie suddenly remembered something that she wanted to talk to her sister about. Sis, wait. Ellie tapped Nira's shoulder, and the former turned around to face her. Nira had a puzzled look on her face as she turned around. We're only one quest away from ranking up to C-Class. Let's do a D-Rank quest now and also do the rank up test so we can gain access to escort quests. Ellie said. Nira thought for a second, maybe she can take the escort quest to Ares, where she can get another one to travel all the way to the capital city of Ceres. Sure, let's grab our equipment, Nira said as Ellie nodded. The two went back to the forge to arm themselves, Ellie with her swords and Nira with her firearms. She put the new revolver inside a holster that was attached to her belt. She grabbed her musket with the bayonet already attached to it and carried it using the leather sling her mother had made. After they were done, the two went to the front door and started walking towards the guild. 
Along the way, they encountered Marie and Edwina, who were walking down the street on the same path towards the guild. Oh. Hey Nira. Hey Ellie. Edwina waved to get the twins' attention. Fancy meeting you two here, Marie said with a smile plastered on her face. What are you two up to? Edwina asked. We're getting another quest from the guild to take on the rank up test, Nira said. In that case, can we come along? I'm already a rank C, but Edwina is the same as you, and we were about to take a quest for ourselves, Marie said as she motioned at Edwina. Yeah, let's form a party so we can help each other, Edwina said gleefully with a smile. The twins looked at each other and nodded, each wore their own smile. Sure, the more the merrier, right? Ellie said. The group eventually reached the guild, where there were a lot of D-rank quests available. The four girls eventually decided on an extermination quest for goblins. Apparently, there were still some stragglers that were left over from the monster horde and needed to be taken care of. Nira thought this would be a perfect test for her revolver since goblins tend to congregate into groups that they have to take out individually. The quest called for the extermination of 20 goblins and bringing back their ears as proof that the extermination was a success. The group then got the quest approved by the guild maid, and they set off to the northern forest, where the quest dictated that groups of goblins could be found. Along the way, they made some small talk with each other until they eventually reached the forest. All right, weapons out, everyone. There's no telling how many goblins are in this forest. Nira said as she pulled out her revolver. She checked if there was any ammunition inside it and closed it back when she saw there was. Hey, that weapon looks different. Marie said as she looked at the strange weapon Nira was wielding. Aren't you going to use your larger one with the short sword attached to it? She added. Nira shook her head and spoke. No, the trees in this forest are too close together, so shooting this would be difficult. Plus, I just finished this earlier and wanted to see what it could do. Marie nodded in understanding. She too was curious what this weapon made recently, could do. She then saw Nira press part of the weapon and heard an audible clicking sound when she stopped pressing. She then focused on the task at hand and grabbed her bow and an arrow from her quiver. The group then entered the forest. The trees were thick, which allowed little light to pass through the canopy. The sounds of birds chirping could be heard as they saw small rabbits that jumped around in front of them. They did run away when they got too close to them. After a few minutes of walking, the group suddenly heard a stick crack which silenced all the birds that were chirping earlier. They traced the sound to Edwina, who stepped on a twig. Edwina cringed as she whispered sorry. It took a few more steps before they saw a group of five goblins huddled around a small campfire. Sis, Marie, take the first shots, I'll go and take down any left, Ellie said. Nira and Marie nodded as they slowly crept to their shooting positions. Once they were there, Nira gave the signal to shoot. Marie and Nira shot at the same time. The bullet traveled faster than the arrow, so it hit the goblin first, which was hit in the leg, while Marie's shot hit the other goblin in the stomach. Marie realized they didn't kill them in one shot, so she panicked and grabbed another arrow from her quiver. But when she was about to take another shot, she heard another loud bang from Nira, who was beside her. Did she load her weapon already? She thought, when she used the other small weapon she carried last time. It took her a good 10 to 15 seconds before she was ready to shoot again. She was surprised at the rate Nira was shooting her weapon. Was this the improvement she made with her new weapon? Perhaps. After the first goblin died from her second shot, Nira pressed the hammer down again to cycle the action as the cylinder rotated to chamber the next round to be fired. After it did, she pressed the trigger again as the hammer slammed into the firing ball pin, which transferred the energy to the small doom slime core inside the cartridge. The core ignited, which in turn ignited the gunpowder that was packed alongside it, and the expanding gases from the controlled explosion propelled the bullet forward. The grooves in the barrel helped the bullet spin in the air, making it more accurate. It didn't take long before the bullet reached its target, which was the head of the second goblin. It impacted the goblin's head with such force that it threw it towards the ground. The other goblins panicked the first time they heard the noise of the revolver firing and started running away. But before they could get away, Nira had already placed a bullet in each of their heads in quick succession. She smirked and like the cowgirl she is, she spun her revolver in her hand before she opened up the cylinder and unloaded the spent cartridges on her hand. She then placed the used ones inside the compartment where she stored her ammunition and grabbed a speed loader from it. She then loaded it once again with the speed loader and closed the cylinder again. When she did, she made a little inspection of the firearm to check for cracks and deformities to which she found none. 
She smiled in satisfaction that her firearm performed perfectly without any flaws. She then looked back at her companions to see what they would think of her newly made firearm, and their expressions were as amusing as she thought they would be. Ellie and Marie were staring wide-eyed at her, while Edwina was seen staring at her with admiration. 31. Chapter 28. Deadly Encounter. Sis, what was that? Ellie was the first to break out of her shock. I told you, it's the weapon I finished earlier, Nira answered while she still wore the smirk because of her companion's reactions. I... I've never seen someone shoot so fast, Marie commended as she held her bow tight. Nira held her pistol up with both hands. Of course, fingers are off the trigger since there isn't a safety mechanism implemented into it. Edwina though? She looked at the weapon Nira was holding. She wanted to know its secrets and how it worked. Maybe she'll ask Nira how it works later. Does it use the same principles as that long weapon you're carrying right now? Murray asked, curious about the connection between two strange weapons that she had never seen before. Theoretically, yes. Nira said it blatantly. She would never give out the secret inner workings of her firearms. Especially in a world where people would do anything to get rich. Okay, then I will not dwell on it further. Let's hunt down more goblins. We need to finish this quest today, or you three have to do the guild C rank test tomorrow, Marie said. The group agreed to move deeper into the forest in hopes of encountering another group of goblins. They reached the middle of the forest when they heard a large roar, which silenced the forest's ambient noise. What? Was that? Ellie asked as she slowly drew her blade. Nira once again drew her revolver from her holster and checked if there was any ammo inside it after cocking back the hammer, ready to fire at the first sign of danger. I don't know, but it sounds very, very angry, Edwina said as she stood behind the twins and Marie as another roar came out. This time, it sounded really close. The group traced the noises that came in front of them. Marie, with her heightened hearing, noticed that the roars were somewhat distorted like someone was trying to scream in a thunderstorm. Oh God. Murray whispered with full worry in her voice. We need to get out of here. Murray said as she turned to run. The others followed suit and started running in the opposite direction. Murray, what was that? Ellie said as she ran alongside the elf. It's a her response was interrupted by a lightning bolt that almost hit her. Their eyes opened wide as they gazed back on the foe who had seemingly shot them with it. They saw what looked like a deer, but its antlers were made of steel and its body was covered in a thick coat of black fur traced with glowing blue edges. Dear Lord, what in purgatory hell is that? Ellie exclaimed as she stood in front of Nira. Just in case it shoots another lightning bolt. It's a stem hash. Rank a monster. Edwina shouted. Let's get out of here, now. Nira said as the stem hash pointed its antlers at them for another attack. It's going for another attack. Move. Nira shouted. The stem hash fired off another lightning bolt which almost hit the group. Ellie was lying down as bells rang inside her head from the shockwave of the lightning bolt. Nira, Marie, and Edwina got up, but Nira checked on Ellie since she was the closest to where the attack hit. Nira then helped her sister up with some kind words. On your feet, Ellie, we are leaving. Nira shouted as she pushed Ellie to run with Edwina and Marie. Nira was behind the group as she helped the group try to escape by firing her revolver at the monster. The deer took several hits to the head but was unfazed in its pursuit. Until, with the last round in the cylinder, Nira managed to hit it in the eye. The bullet only ricocheted off of the deer's skull, but this only made it really, really mad. It immediately fired off another lightning bolt that hit near Nira's position, which sent the adventurer flying and falling down a steep slope due to the shockwave. All Nira could hear was the pained scream of her sister, who turned back to see what happened. Nira. 28. Chapter 29, New Friend After the group lost Nira to the Stumhersh, they immediately reported the encounter to the guild, which sent out a small search party. Ellie, Edwina, and Marie were with them. Meanwhile, Nira lay unconscious from the fall. She heard some light footsteps that were approaching her from the front, which she stared awake from. When she opened her eyes, all she could see was a dense forest with a thick canopy overhead. The footsteps that were approaching her suddenly vanished. She shook her head and checked around to find her pistol, which she still held. Her musket, though, it was sticking upright behind her with its bayonet stabbed into the ground. She frowned when she noticed the barrel was bent beyond repair possibly due to the fall and it looked like it hit a boulder on the way down. So it was better to craft up a newer, better long-arm weapon. She grasped her revolver tightly and checked the compartment where she stored the ammunition. To her dismay, 
she only found two speed loaders left, each with six rounds. So, in total, she can only fire 18 shots, and thought that she better make those 18 count. I need to regroup with the others, Nira said as she noticed that the sun was setting. She would have to make camp for the night. It's either that or get lost, finding the way back to civilization, which she would rather not do. So, she started walking on what she thought was the southern path to find a place where she could hunker down and make camp for the night. Unbeknownst to Nira, however, she wasn't just hearing things earlier. Inside the bush that was beside her were a pair of glowing eyes that looked curiously at Nira. When she started walking away, the creature followed her out of her peripheral vision. As the night drew on, countless noises from creatures in the forest echoed through. Then I found a small clearing, and in the center was a pile of boulders that had a fallen tree over them, which looked like a small den that could be used as shelter. Nira had to check if there were any creatures that were already living in it, so she pulled out her revolver and carefully approached the formation. She held her breath as she pointed the gun inside the formation and found nothing. There were no wolves or foxes that would call this their home. Satisfied, she then sat down inside the formation and grabbed two pieces of wood she could make a fire from. The night started to get cold, so she needed a fire to stay warm. She tried and tried, but no matter how many times she tried, she could not start a fire. She then got an idea. She pulled out a single cartridge from a speed loader and turned it upside down. Then, with careful hands, she grabbed the small doom slime core inside it and placed it on a pile of sticks. She then grabbed a rock and smashed it against the core. The small monster core ignited the sticks and turned it into a small fire. She then grabbed a larger stick and poked around to get the monster core out of the fire. She did get it out eventually and put the core back inside the cartridge, ready to be fired. Her moment of victory was cut short by the sound of her stomach demanding input. So she grabbed her bag and pulled out some rations, like dried bacon strips. Thank God I bought some from the market before we left, she said slowly to herself. While she was eating, she couldn't turn down the sense that she was being watched. The sound of a stick breaking from the outside immediately kicked in the adrenaline as she grabbed her revolver and pulled back the hammer. She peeked outside to see what caused the noise, but again, she found nothing. She remained vigilant as she heard the sound of eating. When she looked back, she saw something that she could only describe as cute. Inside was a small white fox. It had silver edges to the tails, yes, tails. It had three of them, paws and ears. It is currently munching on the dried bacon strips she left earlier when she left to look for any dangers. The fox noticed her as it stopped what it was doing and immediately leapt to hide inside a pile of sticks in the corner. Nira could have sworn she saw the secondary colors turn from silver to yellow before they dove into the stick pile. She giggled at its actions as she carefully went to grab the stick of bacon the fox was chewing. She then held it out in front of the stick pile and said, Are you hungry? Here, eat it. It's for you. Morfu? The fox said as its head peeked out from the pile. Go on, take it, Nira said. Morfu? The colors on the fox's ears suddenly turned bright pink as it jumped out of the pile and snatched the bacon strip from Nira's hand with its mouth. Nira giggled as she sat down on the ground near the fire grabbed another one from her bag, and started eating it. She was startled when the fox jumped onto her lap with an accompanying Morfu. She smiled as she patted the fox on her lap, the latter started purring as it waged all three of its tails while munching on the piece of dried bacon. She looked down at the fox and started murmuring about the thing it said all the time. Hum, Morfu, I'll call you Morfu then, she said as she rubbed the fox's back with her hand. Morfu tilde the fox purred and rubbed its head on Nira's hand. 31. Chapter 30. Morphe the Foxo. The next day arrived. Nira woke to the smell of her campfire going out. When she opened her eyes, the first thing she saw was Morphe. The small, three-tailed fox huddled around near her face, so he was the first thing she saw. She then got up and scratched her eye, followed by a yawn. The movement startled Morphe a bit, so he also started to wake up. Good morning, Morphe, Nira said as she got up. Morphe. The fox was a bit tired, so it took him some time to fully wake up. She saw Morfu's ears and tail tips turn a silver color for a moment before turning back to black. After Nira did some stretching, she holstered her pistol and grabbed her bag. By this time, Morfu was also awake and was now on all fours, following Nira. The tips of the fox's ears and tail also turned their normal silver color. They walked for what it felt like to be a couple of hours. Nira periodically stopped to eat as well as feeding Morfu some of her last food. She had to risk of being vulnerable by using one of her remaining cartridges to hunt. 
When she was about to leave to go hunt for food, Morfu came along and had a dead rabbit in his jaw. Morfu, Morfu said as he placed the rabbit near Nira. Nira was surprised that Morfu was able to hunt relatively quickly, and with a creature as big as him. So she patted Morfu's head, to which Morfu gave her a satisfied, Morfu tilde. Nira then grabbed a knife to start butchering the rabbit for its meat and removed the bones. A couple of minutes later she manages to start another campfire, using the same method she used yesterday. She cooked the rabbit meat and started eating while she also fed Morfu as she ate. After their little lunch break, they continued with their walk once again. Nira knew that she needed to find a river that usually goes through this forest. Because if she followed it downstream, she would find the walled town of Redfield. Her sister and parents must be worried sick, that only made her even more determined to find her way back home. Her eyes focused on Morfu for a bit, maybe he could help find the river with his sharp nose and hearing. Just as she was about to ask Morfu for something, the two heard a loud, thunderous clock in front of them. That could only mean one thing, the Stumhersh was near their location. Morfu was shaking as he looked straight in front of them, so Nira picked him up and ran towards a nearby bush. Nira peered through the leaves to see the Stumhersh clopping towards their last known location, still with the injured eye it suffered from Nira yesterday. She guessed it wanted payback. It looked around to see where Nira was, but she stayed completely still, even holding her breath in the process. Adrenaline was coursing through her veins, telling her to run, but she fought through those instincts and stayed completely still. When she looked at Morfu by her side, he was slowly backing away. She saw the Stumhersh breath out in frustration as it slowly clocked away. But before it could go away, a loud crack, possibly from a stick, could be heard. Nira turned around to see that Morfu had stepped on a stick, which caused the noise. Nira immediately picked up Morfu and dashed out of the bush before it got hit by a lightning bolt. Nira ran around while she carried the small fox in her arms. She pulled out her revolver and started unloading on the deer. She fired off five shots that hit the deer in multiple areas that included the leg, torso, head, antler, and even the abdomen when it stood up on two legs, trying to intimidate Nira. All of them ricocheted off the deer's body. The problem with revolvers is that they sometimes lack the penetration needed to kill large animals. As she readied her final round, the deer started a charge right at Nira, aiming to impale her with its antlers. Nira managed to dodge in the last possible second, but she tripped on the landing. She tried to get back up before getting electrocuted by the deer behind her. Her pained screams grew silent as she fell limp on the ground, Morfu jumping out of her arms. Morfu! The fox tried to get Nira to stand up again, but the girl was too injured. Morfu. Run. Nira spoke in a low voice as the fox noticed that the deer was slowly moving up to them. Morfu did as he was told and ran towards a bush. Morfu can't let the person who was so kind to him die here. After all, he was just investigating the spot where a battle happened inside his territory when she saw Nira laying on the ground. He healed Nira's wounds from the fall with his special ability which allowed him to heal wounds that could kill a person by licking. He was so startled when she woke up that he jumped into a nearby bush to hide. He kept a close eye on Nira after that happened, but as day turned to night, he was getting hungry. He saw an opportunity to take a bite of Nira's food when she left, but was surprised at how compassionate she was when she fed him her food. Nira didn't know, but that night, Morfu decided that she would help Nira find her way back home. But he also made another decision after they slept together. He will live with her as her spirit companion. So with determination in his veins, Morfu leapt out of the bush to confront the Stumhash and stood between it and Nira. Morfu. What are you doing? Just leave me, Nira said, almost whispering, as she stared at the scene in front of her. Morfu did not comply, though, as he felt a deep connection between himself and her. Suddenly, a large amount of power surged through his body making him larger and larger until he was at least five times his original size. He was even bigger than Stumhersh, who stepped back during Morfu's transformation. Morfu. Nira murmured before she passed out from her injuries. After Nira passed out, the large, three-tailed fox looked like his small version with the white fur. The main difference is that the tips of his tail, paws, and ears were now glowing with alternating colors like a rainbow, and he had nine tails instead of three. Morfu looked at his opponent with renewed confidence in his glowing purple eyes and charged forward to deliver the first strike with a deep and angry. Morfu, 25, Chapter 31, Titanic Clash. Morfu surged forth, his eyes aimed at the one place where all canines aim, the throat. 
but the Stumhash was quick and evaded his charge. It then fired a lightning bolt in Morphe's direction, but when it struck, he braced for impact and prepared to get hurt. He opened his eyes to see that he was unscathed. Morphe leaned his head down as he concentrated most of his elemental mana forward. The glowing rainbow tips on his ears, tail, and paws turned red as a giant fireball headed towards the Stumhash. The deer managed to evade, but only by a small margin. Morfu continued to fire off fireball after fireball as the deer maneuvered itself with its lightning quick reflexes. As it was about to dodge another fireball, Morfu's secondary colors turned blue as he shot off a water ball that turned to steam as soon as it hit the fireball. The deer was surprised by the action and went to face Morfu. But, blinded by the steam, he did not see Morfu coming behind him. It was too late, as the Stumhash tried to parry the attack but was met by Morfu's jaw. The Stumhash wailed in pain as Morfu bit into its hind leg and tried to shake Morfu off. But Morfu was not having any of it, and his secondary colors turned bright blue. Suddenly, the deer was surrounded by a multitude of ice spikes that were aiming right at it. A split second before the spikes hit, however, the deer let out a thunderous stomp that produced a shockwave so powerful that it shattered all the ice spikes that were going to hit it. It also shot Morfu back, but he landed on his feet. While Morfu was recovering, the deer started an electrified charge as blue lightning covered its entire body, and whenever it stepped on the ground, trails of lightning followed in its wake. Morfu sensed the incoming danger and stomped on the ground as his colors changed again to brown. A thick wall made out of rock suddenly sprouted from the ground between Morfu and the charging Stumhash. When the deer impacted the wall, its antlers shattered as the tremendous force was held back by the thick stone slab. It noticed that if it continued, the antlers would be completely shattered, so it pulled out of the charge by jumping backwards. The deer waited for Morfu to go around the wall to confront it, but what it did not expect was that Morfu used his own version of lightning to shatter the wall, which caught the deer by surprise. Morfu's tips turned yellow, and yellow lightning surrounded him as he charged at the deer with all his might. The deer tried to get away but was immediately met by Morfu's lightning bolt, which caused it to stagger. Morfu found an opening to bite the deer's throat, but the deer dodged at the last second. Morfu recovered, but the deer managed to headbutt him, which caused Morfu to be launched into a nearby tree. Blue lightning surrounded the deer once again as it prepared for another charge. His head was dead set on impaling Morfu on its antlers, or what's left of them. It stomped with such force that it cracked the ground it stood on. Blue lightning came down from the heavens and surrounded it as it sprung with the force of a typhoon. Its head lowered, aimed at Morfu, as it chattered with all its might, blue lightning arching behind its wake. Morfu sensed the danger and came up with a plan. His secondary colors turned blue as he fired a water ball at it. He then fired a fireball, which hit the water ball and created a smoke screen that blinded the charging deer. The deer passed through the smoke, hoping that it would hit the giant nine-tailed fox, but was met by a huge boulder. Unable to stop, it hit the boulder with such force that its steel antlers broke apart and shattered. Then it noticed the danger behind him, so it turned its body to the side but did not expect Morfu, with his jaw opened, fired a fireball at point-blank range, completely disintegrating the creature's head as its body felt limp and dropped to the ground dead. Morfu had claimed victory, but as soon as he realized that he had killed the Stumhash, he rushed back to the unconscious Nira, who was still on the forest floor. Morfu. He then slowly returned to his small, three-tailed fox form and ran towards Nira's side. He noticed that Nira was still breathing, but it was faint, so Morfu started licking her forehead, trying desperately to heal her. His worries were cut short when Nira started to stir. Nira had awoken from her unconscious state, and what she saw was a battlefield fought between two great powers. Trees are cut in half, some are even burning. Creators struck about as her eyes fell on the dead corpse of the Stumhash. Morfu, she was then surprised as Morfu leapt into her arms and started nuzzling his head against her chest. Morfu, did you do all of this? Nira said as she held up the small fox in her arms. Morfu, 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 the fox said this as it made small nods. Wow, you're just full of surprises. Nira commented as he slowly put down Morfu. I'll report this to the guild once we return to Redfield. Nira spoke as Morfu agreed silently. Come on, Morfu, let's go home, Nira said as she kneeled down with her arms open. Morfu jumped into her arms as Nira picked him up. Morfu was very tired after that battle, so he peacefully slept as Nira carried him in her arms. It's hard to believe this small fox took out something as big as that Stumhash, 
she thought as she looked at the sleeping fox in her arms. Nira then heard the noise of water flowing as she started walking in its direction, leaving behind the carcass of the Stumhash and the battlefield created by it and the small fox she was carrying. 26. Chapter 32. Reunion and Discussion. Nira had found the river she was looking for and put down Morfu. The fox was awake by then and asked repeatedly to be put down with constant movements and noises. So Nira was obliged to do so, and the two then walked down, following the current until they had reached the forest edge. Waiting for them was a small group of four people that looked like knights with their steel armor. Then they ran up towards Nira and Morfu's position to assess her condition. Contact the other groups. Tell them we found her. One of them, Nira, is getting checked by one of them for injuries. The knight was relieved when he found none, so they guided Nira towards the position of the other group that included her sister, Muri, and Edwina. While walking, Morfu felt a little nervous to see other humans, possibly for the first time, so Nira picked him up in her arms to comfort him. When they reached the position of the other search party, Nira was suddenly tackled by Ellie. Sis, you're alive. Thank God you're safe. Thank God you're safe. She said this while hugging her sister tightly and borrowing her head in Nira's large bosom while on the ground. Morfu ran behind Nira's body as he was surprised by the act. Murray then came kneeling down beside her and said, Thank the heavens you're alive. Ellie grew restless while you were absent. And don't get us started when we told your mom. She had a panic attack. Edwina then continued. Sis, please don't ever leave us again. Ellie said, which was a bit muffled since her head was still buried inside Nira's chest. It wasn't much of a choice, really, since that Stumhash hit me so close that it launched me down a slope, Nira said while she rubbed the back side of her head. That reminds me, what did happen to the Stumhash? Marie said as she held her head deep in thought. Well, I didn't get to see the entire fight, but Morfu finished him off. Nira said as she slowly stood back up, as did Ellie, who released Nira from the bear hug. Morfu? Who's that? Murray said as she also stood up. Morfu, you can stop hiding behind me, Nira said as she turned her torso to see that Morfu was hiding behind her legs. Morfu. He said this as Nira picked him up so the rest of the girls could see him. This little guy took him out. That's kind of hard to believe, Ellie said. No, it's understandable, Murray said. What do you mean? Ellie said. Morfu here is a vulpin a magical fox creature that has immense magical abilities but needs them to make a soul contract with somebody to fully awaken those abilities. Murray explained. So you're telling me this little guy is really strong but needs someone to make a soul contract with? Ellie asked. Yes, and it seems Morfu has chosen you to be his soul partner, Nira. Murray said with a smile. Incredible, I've never seen a vulpin in close proximity before, Edwina said as she examined Morfu. Morfu, though, wasn't so happy with Edwina staring. His secondary colors turned gray as he hit his face from his fluffy body and did so with a scared Morfu. Edwina, I think you're scaring him a bit, Nira said as she noticed that Morfu was uncomfortable. Sorry, I've just never seen one this close before, let alone visually see the intriguing details Morfu has to offer. Edwina said as she pulled back from all the staring she did at Morfu. Morfu lifted his small head a bit so he could see what was happening with a barely audible Morfu. Let's head back, mom and dad are so worried sick about you, Ellie said. The group agreed to be pulled back from the search because they had found what they were looking for. But at the same time, Nira started to plan out how to make something that could penetrate more and deal more damage from a long arm. So she started to remember all the parts she would need to manufacture a lever action rifle, as well as a new kind of priming method using the doom slime cores. While they were returning to Redfield, Guildmaster Victor was hard at work signing papers in his office as the door opened. A guildmaid peeked her head into the room and said, Guildmaster S-rank adventurer, Lady Amiria Faberos, is waiting for you. The guildmaster breathed a sigh of relief that the lead guildmaster had sent an S-ranker to help with the growing problem inside the northern forests. Let her in, he said as the guildmaid bowed and went downstairs. Waiting downstairs was an elf, her class was archer, given that she has a magically enchanted bow with a golden shine and a string that looks like silver. She had a cowl that hid her golden hair, which was let loose and so long that it reached her knees. Her eyes were a beautiful emerald green color, and her face could only be described with one word, beautiful. She had a blue cape with different embroidered golden symbols, among them was one in the shape of a golden bow. She also had a quiver with specially crafted arrows made to do maximum damage at impact. 
She wore a beautifully designed tunic underneath as well as a blue skirt with golden trims that went down to her thighs. She also wore white knee-high socks with golden trims and expensive-looking boots. Overall, her appearance screamed Esranka. Lady Amiria, the guild master is ready to receive you, the maid said as she bowed. I am going up now, thank you. Lady Amiria said as she walked upstairs to the floor where the guild master was located. A knock came inside the office, and the guild master replied with an audible come in. Lady Amiria came inside the guild master's office as Victor motioned for her to sit beside a chair. Greetings, Lady Amiria he grinned. To you as well, guild master Victor, she replied. I am sure you were informed of why you were dispatched here, he said. I am aware that monsters are moving in an unusual pattern and away from their original habitat, Lady Amiria said. Then, I can trust that you can help handle this issue, he asked. Yes, just assign me your most capable archer and swordsman. She said it with all the seriousness and formality you would expect for someone of her rank. Very well, he replied. I think I know the two who fit that criteria he thought. 26. Chapter 33, A New Cartridge When the twins arrived home, her mother burst into tears and tackled Nira. Morfu dodged the fall from both his sole friend and her mother. Nira, thank God you're all right. You didn't get any injuries, right? No loss of limbs as well. She frantically checked every part of Nira's body. I'm all right, mom. Morfu here finished off that dear. Nira replied, to which Mirabel seemed confused. Morfu, who's that? Your new lover. She said this as she looked at Nira with a teasing expression. No mom, he's the little fox beside you, Nira corrected, pouting a bit. Morfu? Mirabel found the small, three-tailed fox, who jumped a little bit when Mirabel turned her gaze towards him. This little guy beat that deer. Mirabel said she was skeptical that the little fox had killed that large deer empowered by lightning magic. Yeah, mom, it was even hard for me to believe it at first as well, Ellie said as she gently tried to pat Morfu. Morfu. Morfu then ran away and hid himself under Nira's palm. Unfortunately, he's a bit shy, Ellie said, disappointed. As long as you're safe, Nira, and thank you, Morfu, for saving her life, she said, to which Morfu peeked out from Nira's palm and said, Morfu. After their small family reunion was complete, Nira went to the forge to visit her old man, who was waiting for the evening rush in the shop. Nira, you're okay. He said this as he stopped what he was doing and walked up to Nira. He then gave her a tight hug, and Nira returned it. How did you manage to escape the Stamhersh? He asked as he pulled away. Morfu here killed it before it had a chance to finish me off, Nira explained briefly. In that case, thank you, Morfu, for saving her life, Marcus said as he kneeled down to try and pat Morfu. Morfu, but Morfu ran behind Nira but peeked his small head from the side of Nira's leg. I guess he's a bit shy, Marcus said as he stood back up. You should get some rest after all those two days inside a forest alone. He said as he went back to man his post inside the shop. You don't need any help, Dad. Nira asked as she picked up Morfu and noted that he had such fluffy fur. Nah, you just rest, I'll handle the shop. I've been doing this since you were a baby, Nira, Marcus said with a smirk. You got me there, old man, I'll go take a nap then, Nira said, to which Marcus nodded. She left the forge and went upstairs to her room. There she freshened herself up a bit and took a bath, after which she went to bed with Morfu climbing up and sleeping on her stomach. Nira woke up hours later, it was already night, and her family was most likely sleeping. So she woke Morfu gently with a tug on his tail. Morfu? Morfu sleepily said as he wobbly woke up and got off Nira. On the rug beside Nira's bed, Morfu continued sleeping. Nira then placed a small blanket over Morfu as the little fox slept quietly. Nira then snuck down to the forge without waking her sister, mother, or father. Her main objective is to reach the forge and start crafting a lever-action rifle to replace the broken musket she lost when the Stumhersh attacked her. She had reached the forge and lit a small candle on the crafting table to begin the process of making the lever-action rifle. She put on her apron, which was hanging on the wall to her right, and walked up near the center of the forge. She still remembered the parts needed, and it looked pretty simple. The first order of business was making a larger .44 cartridge to base the diameter of the barrel. With the new electric motor she has, she can just roll out brass sheets into casings instead of using parchment as her casing. So she heated a piece of brass inside a furnace to hammer it into a sheet. 
Then, Nero pulled out her makeshift electric motor and attached a special attachment to it that had two roller wheels to squeeze the brass into the shape of the casing. After the brass was malleable, she then used a hammer and an anvil to shape the piece into what resembled a sheet. After it was done, she then used the rollers on the electric motor to roll the sheet into a cylinder. In total, she made 20 of these casings, each one longer than the current cartridge she used on her pistol. Next, she carved a piece of wood to resemble the bullet she would need for it, and used casting techniques to mold the lead she heated earlier into shape. After she had made 20 bullets, she sat down on the crafting bench with all the pieces she needed. The brass case has a small hole in the center of the cylinder where her makeshift primer should be, but Nira had a different approach. In its place, she put a relatively thick layer of steel that matches the diameter of the hole. She then placed the gunpowder inside the brass casings and fitted the bullet, which was the right size, into the opening of the cylinder to cap it off. She then took measurements of the casing and used the measurements to start drilling the 24-inch barrel for her rifle. Her goal was to finish the barrel tonight and the entire rifle by tomorrow. So she switched the attachment on her electric motor again and used the drill attachment. She then turned it on by channeling a bit of lightning mana to the copper ports as the drill started spinning. She then grabbed a steel rod and slowly mounted it on the little rack she used when she made the barrel for her revolver. The drill turned the rod into a cylinder and replaced the drill bit with the special drill she made that produced the rifling in her revolver. She then lowered the amount of lightning mana that was being pumped inside the electric motor to spin it slowly as the drill did its thing and made the grooves inside. The barrel matched the ones on the barrel she had cast earlier. After she was done, she checked for any deformities and was relieved to find none. When she gazed outside the window, she noticed that the sun was slowly coming up, which meant it took several hours to finish the first part of her weapon. So she extinguished the flames that kept the furnace alive and stored the electric motor set up under the crafting table. After cleaning herself up a bit upstairs, she hurriedly got back to bed to go to sleep before her family woke up. 24. Chapter 34. Race Against Time. Nira woke up later that day to continue crafting her new weapon. After breakfast, Ellie was able to catch her before she was able to get inside the forge. Nira, why are you so committed to go inside the forge today? Elliot said as she crossed her arms. I was going to tell you later, since you asked. I'm making a new musket, Nira answered with a hand on her hip. Musket? Is that what you call that long tube thing? Ellie asked, to which Nira nodded. Then what are you making then? Ellie continued. Oh, I'm just making some improvements on its design, Nira answered briefly. Well, okay then. Ellie said as she remembered why she asked for Nira's attention. Oh yeah, sis, the guildmaster wants us to report to his office by noon. Do you think you can get it done by then? Ellie said, and Nira seemed puzzled. What for? We didn't do anything that would cause us to lose our guild cards. Nira said. I think it's more of a special quest than a demotion or getting our cards revoked. Ellie explained, to which Nira nodded in understanding. All right, I'll see if I can finish it by noon, Nira answered. Okay, good luck, sis, I'll go train with dad, he's waiting for me outside the city walls. She then picked up the bag that was near the door. All right, have fun out there, Nira said with a small smile. Sure, sis, I'll meet you at the guild at high noon. Ellie then waved her sister goodbye as she left the house. Nira was now against the clock to finish the lever action rifle. Noon was about five hours away, so she had to hurry and finish. She swiftly entered the forge and immediately turned on the furnace. She then grabbed a big chunk of steel and readied her electric motor attached to a milling drill to start making the main body of the rifle. Morphew entered the forge when he woke up. He was still sleepy, though, so he took a spot in the corner of the forge to continue his small nap. Not before he got woken up by the sound of electric drills bearing inside the metal. Morphew couldn't sleep with all the noise so he left the forge again to sleep on Nira's bed, at least for two hours more. Nira didn't notice Morfu's little escapade and was dead focused on finishing her rifle. She slowly drew out the shape of the main body, which had small holes for pins where parts like the bolt, hammer, lever, and tubular magazine would go. With careful hands, she also poured a bit of water on the metal she was working on so it wouldn't get too hot. After she was finished, she was left with a frame with the exact measurements she needed to finish the rifle. She then checked for any cracks that could hinder her firearm, and she found none. After she was satisfied, she then took out another long steel rod that is almost as long as the 24-inch barrel. She slowly drilled a hole into the center of it that could fit the cartridge inside. 
Shenren tested it out by dropping a cartridge she made last night inside it and slowly descending before stopping at the bottom, which was capped off. She was satisfied with the outcome and moved on to cast the different parts that she still needed. She then picked up some clay and slowly manipulated it into the different parts she needed. The first was a T-shaped part that had a small hole in the other end, which was the lifter. It's used to lift the cartridges from the tubular magazine and into the firing chamber. Next was a crescent-shaped object that would act as the trigger. It also had a small hole on the side of it so it could mount onto the frame. The hammer, which is in a very interesting shape, would fit inside its housing at the back. Its job is the same as the revolver she made, in which it will slam the firing pin that would ignite the propellant. The next one is the firing pin, which was a long, narrow, circular rod that normally had a pointy end at one side. What Nero did was mold the clay to have a small dip at the end where she would place a doom slime core, which would slam into the thick steel disc under the modified cartridge she made, which would in turn cause it to combust and ignite the gunpowder inside, almost like a centerfire primer type. Finally, she molded the lever that will cycle the action and load a cartridge into the firing chamber. She then let it dry inside the furnace. She then placed steel ingots inside a crucible and into the same furnace where the mold was drying. While she waited for them to finish, she then used the electric drill to finish off the remaining parts, like the bolt, which will ram the cartridge inside the firing chamber, the sear, which will hold back the firing pin to prepare it to strike the cartridge, and the follower, which will push the cartridge towards the lifter using a spring, where it will lift it up for the bolt to ram it inside the firing chamber. After she milled all of the parts, she placed them on the crafting table along with the barrel and frame to wait for the other components before she started final assembly. She went back to the furnace and took out the molds she made and started using dumbing sand on them inside a wooden frame so that when she removed the mold, all that was left was a cavity where she could pour the molten steel into. After she had done that, she poured the steel inside the cavity and let it harden. Nira took her time to rest before the steel completely hardened. Once hard, she then took each individual component and sanded it down to remove any excess that formed during the casting. After it was complete, she took all of the components and began final assembly. She first inserted the barrel into the firing chamber as well as the tubular magazine. She then placed a long, thin spring inside the tubular magazine before placing the follower inside it. It was a perfect fit, and every component slid down with ease. Next, she used pins to pin the lifter and lever in place. The notches allowed them to be placed on top of each other. She then added the trigger, along with a small spring, and pinned it along with the sear and hammer. Lastly, she inserted a small, long spring into the firing pin with a tiny doom slime core mounted on the tip of the firing pin. She then inserted the firing pin assembly inside the bolt and placed it inside the frame. The bolt had a notch in it which the lever could interact and push it forward and backward. She wiped it with a cloth and started to test it. First, she loaded a dummy round inside the tubular magazine, which was made by using the original cartridge as a mold for which she cast steel. She then loaded the tubular magazine with the dummy round and pulled the lever. She could see that when she pulled it down, the lifter also went down to pick up the round, which the follower pushed on. It also pulled the bolt backwards, which pushed the hammer down, coking it. She then pulled it back to its original position, and the lifter moved up as the bolt pushed it forward and chambered it inside the firing chamber. So far, so good, Nira thought. She then pressed the trigger as the hammer slammed forward, striking the firing pin and she saw that the doom slime core ignited when it struck the dummy round. If that were a real cartridge, it would fire off the cartridge. When she pulled the lever back down, the ejector, made from a small piece of steel, grabbed onto the dummy round, and the spring, along with the notches inside the frame, ejected the bullet into her hand. She then carved out the wooden pieces for the stock and the hand guard for her firearm. She then attached them to the rifle using pins to hold it in place. Nira breathed a sigh of relief that she managed to finish it, and just in time too. She noticed the sun's rays were now near their peak, which meant it was almost noon. So she got kitted up and grabbed the belt that holstered her revolver and ammunition storage. She took out all the lead balls from her ammunition storage and replaced them with the .44 cartridges she made for her lever action rifle. The rifle itself looked like an old Winchester Model 1873. She then grabbed her newly made lever action rifle and dashed out of the front door. Morfu was waiting for her there so she picked him up onto her shoulder as she ran towards the Adventures Guild. Spoiler, to those who aren't familiar with firearms, here's a picture of what Nira made in this chapter. Winchester Model 1873. 
And here are the components. Did I manage to explain it correctly? Collapse, 23, Chapter 35, Quest Briefing. Nira reached her destination, which was the guild. Her sister, Ellie, was already standing by the entrance, waiting for her. Her sword was sheathed inside the scabbard, which was on her belt. Sis, you made it just in time. The guild master is already calling for us to go inside his room. Ellie said, is that the new Musukuit? You made? She added, pronouncing musket wrongly. Yep, I managed to finish it just in time, let's go in then. Nira said this as Ellie noticed that Morfu was hanging onto Nira's shoulder like a cat. Once they entered the guild, it was still as lively as it ever was. A guild maid was waiting for them at the bottom of the stairs. D-rank adventurers Nira and Ellie Augustine, the guild master is waiting for you inside his office. She said this as she turned around to start climbing up the stairs. Follow me, please. She added. Nira and Ellie looked at each other and shrugged as they followed the guild maid towards the guild master's office. While walking, Nira started constructing in her head what the guild master would call them for. Her thoughts were interrupted by the guild maid knocking on the door to the guild master's office. Come in. A firm yet audible voice came from the other side as the maid motioned for them to come inside. Guild Master Victor, Adventurers Nira, and Ellie Augustine are here, she said. Both Nira and Ellie were in slight awe of the sight of the Guild Master's office. Behind the chair where he sat was a huge glass window from which they could see the entire town plaza. Just adjacent to the Guild Master's position was a woman that looked to be an elf wearing expensive looking clothes. And from the bow and quiver as well as the emblem on her cape, Nira deduced that she belonged to the archer class. Thank you, Rose. You may leave us with our business. Guild Master Victor spoke as the maid bowed and exited the room. He then motioned for them to sit down opposite him, to which they complied. The elf, though, never took her gaze off of Nira, specifically the two weapons she carries, the revolver and the newly made lever action rifle, and Morfu, who was avoiding her gaze. Morfu. He said it in a low voice. I am sure you are wondering why I called you two specifically here. Victor and the twins nodded to his assumption. Firstly, introductions. Nira and Ellie Augustine, meet Lady Amiria Faberos, an S-rank adventurer dispatched to aid us in our problem, he said as he turned wide-eyed towards the elf in question. Greetings, Nira and Ellie, Lady Amiria said with a smile. It's nice to meet you as well, Lady Amiria, Nira said. Me too, Ellie said as she avoided the elf's gaze. An S-rank adventurer, this is either really good or really bad. S-rankers are only dispatched for the most hazardous quests, which means that if she's here, it means that the situation is really bad Nira thought silently. Now that introductions are out of the way, we can proceed to why you two were called here. Victor said as he stood up. His large, muscular frame then walked up towards a rolled up piece of parchment and placed it on the table, where he unrolled it to reveal the map of the surrounding area. The recent increase of monster activity can be traced to one location, he said as he pointed at Northwood Forest, which was at the foot of a mountain range. Here, it seems like monsters were fleeing from this area, but we don't know what. He continued. So you want us to go in and find out the cause? Ellie assumed Victor gave a slight nod. Yes, we need to find out what is really causing these monsters to flee from their original habitat. If a creature such as the Stumhash that attacked you flees southward, it means that the reason is either a dragon or something that involves dark magic. In any case, Lady Amiria is here to help us locate and disarm that threat before the situation gets dire. The two of you are here because Lady Amiria would need all the extra help she could get, he explained, to which Nira nodded. What time are we heading out? Nira asked, which, to her surprise, Lady Amiria answered. We leave at dusk because the monsters may be more active at night, as well as the mysterious entity that is driving the monsters out. The twins nodded as they turned back to Victor. If you both can complete this quest, I will personally promote you to C-rank adventurers without the need for a class rank up examination. He announced it, which only made Nira and Ellie more determined to finish it. If you do not have any further questions, you may leave and prepare for the quest ahead. Victor said as the twins and Lady Amiria nodded and exited the guildmaster's office. Outside the office, Ellie and Nira were talking with each other about how to prepare for the long night ahead of them when Lady Amiria approached them. Looking at Nira the whole time. Lady Amiria, what brings you to our conversation? Nira said. Lady Amiria, though, shook her head in disapproval. You can drop the formalities, I'm just Amiria right now, she said. Okay, but why are you here? Ellie as she crossed her arms. I'm just curious about your sister, 
specifically her strange weapon and the fact that she had tamed a vulpin. She said, if you want, I haven't tested it yet. Maybe I could show it to you in the guild's probing ground, Nira said as she grasped her rifle tightly. Oh, and his name is Morfu. She said this while her thumb pointed at Morfu. Morfu, it would be wonderful if I could see your weapon work for the first time, Amiria said with a soft smile on her face. All right, let's go to the guild's proving ground then, Nira said as the group started walking downstairs. 21. Chapter 36. Proving Ground. The three went down the steps back towards the lobby. Nira noticed that some adventurers would start whispering with their party members when they saw the elven S-class archer. She then thought it was natural since the person beside her is an S-ranker. A class that is the highest in the guild and that only a handful of adventurers of different ethnicities and species would be included in. They then approached the door, which Nira thought was a utility room, but her guess was wrong when it opened back out to the outside world. Now that she thought about it, she never did see the so-called proving ground of the guild in her almost three years as an adventurer. But nevertheless, the place looked more like a football stadium than a proving ground. Benches that were stacked three high can be seen on the outer edges where people would sit to watch an event, possibly by two adventurers settling disputes by combat. In the center was a raised stone platform where the guild rank up test would be held. The three went up the small steps that led to the platform. They then saw white lines that separated the platform into two as well as a circle located at the center, with the middle point represented as a dot. So far, nothing out of the ordinary yet. Hey, Amiria, what's so special about this place? Aren't the spectators going to be hurt with all the fighting and projectiles flying all over the place? Nira asked as she walked up to the elf. Ah, the spectators are actually really safe. There is a magical barrier here made by the runes that are etched beneath this platform that produces a mana shield to block anything that would end up outside. Amiria said as she stepped on a specific spot. Her foot was then lit with purple light from a magic circle that formed under her feet. Both Nira and Ellie suddenly flinched for an unknown reason. Do not be alarmed, it is just the shield activating due to myself channeling elemental mana into the conduit. She explained. Ellie then walked up to the edge of the platform. She then reached her hand out and was a bit startled when she felt a solid, invisible barrier that blocked her hand from reaching a certain distance. Nira nodded in Ellie's direction when she saw what her sister had done. Now what do we do? What do I aim at? Nira turned towards Amiria as she held up her Remington rifle. I'm getting towards that, please wait for a tiny bit. Amiria said as she again channeled her elemental mana towards the conduit that was located beneath her foot. The platform then started shaking as some panels shifted and the platform itself got longer. A small wall that reached their stomachs was erected from the platform beneath them, and on the far end of said platform, stone pillars suddenly rose up. There were ten in total, each with varying sizes and distances. There, an archery range to fit our needs, Amiria said as she stepped off of the conduit. Nira noted that the conduit was the dot inside the circle that was marked by white paint before. Ellie then came up beside Nira as her gaze was fixated on the archer range that seemingly erupted from the platform itself. This is so cool, I wonder if the guild would let me practice my sword in here, Ellie said as she imagined the crazy training she would put herself through. Oh, I'm sorry to inform you that the guild only lets us S-rankers use this in any way we see fit. Anything below us S-ranks would have to write a letter addressed to the guild master if you wish to use the proving ground area, Amiria explained as Ellie slowly sank into a state of sadness. Nira then patted Ellie on the back in condolence as Amiria let out a small giggle at her companion's antics. Time to do what we came here for then, Nira announced as she opened the compartment on her belt to retrieve some cartridges to load inside her lever action rifle. Amiria was looking at Nira curiously as Morfu suddenly awoke from his small nap. The Vulpin's secondary colors changed from black to yellow as it jumped down from Nira's shoulder. Nira then kneeled down to pat the small fox, to which the small fox replied with a cute Morfu. As the colors on his ears, tail, and paws changed into a red color, Ellie then stood back up and walked beside Amiria as Nira started loading the ammunition into the tubular magazine. Of course, the bottom of the cartridge was facing her when she loaded it inside. What are those little pebbles she's loading into that strange tube? Is it the projectile? Amiria thought as she saw Nira pull down the handle of her weapon. Nira noted that the lever was a bit stiff but it still worked in the action of pulling the bolt backwards to cock the hammer while guiding the cartridge into the firing chamber. When she pulled back up, the bolt moved forward, chambering the round inside the firing chamber and leaving the hammer cocked. All right, time to see if all that hard work paid off, 
Nira slowly said to herself as she walked up against the small wall and aimed her weapon. Her target was a small stone pillar that was 400 meters away. Amiria was surprised that Nira was going for the furthest target away. She took note of the way Nira was holding her metal tube and her leg stance while she held it. Nira aimed down on what would usually be iron sights with a post and an aperture, but in her haste to finish the weapon, she forgot to add it in. So she focused on the center of the barrel for her target acquisition. She held her breath as she slowly squeezed the trigger. When she did so, the seer disengaged with the hammer, so there was nothing stopping it from slamming into the firing pin. When it impacted, the firing pin transferred the kinetic energy into the tiny doom slime core on its tip, and it impacted the steel disc that was under the cartridge. The core slammed into the disc, pushing it slightly so that the ignition from the contact would catch the gunpowder waiting to explode and propel the bullet forward. As the bullet traveled through the barrel, the grooves inside it made the bullet spin like a football being spun when thrown by a player. It exited the muzzle with such speed that it left the S-rank adventurer elf with them wide-eyed. Smoke covered the middle of her weapon as the lead bullet hit the target dead in the center, and she noticed that it was cut in half. Which makes sense because the pillar it was shot at was not that thick, only a few millimeters across. Nira breathed fresh oxygen into her lungs as relief filled her body. The lever action rifle she made inside an old blacksmith's forge worked perfectly, with no visible damage to the weapon itself. She pumped her hand up like she won the lottery as she pulled the lever back down, as she did so. The bolt pulled back and the ejector sent the spent brass case into her hand. What have I just witnessed? Amiria thought as she was recovering from Nira's display. Her eyes went even wider when she looked past the pillar with her insanely good vision and noted that the projectile also had made a hole into the shield that was supposed to keep everything in. 22. Chapter 37. Show of Strength. Nira then unloaded all of the cartridges that were inside the tubular magazine. Each shot pierced the pillars that they were aimed at. After all of the pillars were destroyed, Nira collected all of the brass casings that were on the ground to be rearmed with gunpowder and reused. After the display, Ellie approached her along with Morfu. She picked up Morfu, whose secondary colors changed to black as she picked him up. Sis, you said that you made some improvements to that weapon, but you didn't mention that it was that large of an improvement. Ellie said it with shock in her voice. Yes, I'm surprised it worked. After all, you did rush me to finish it before the quest meeting earlier. Nira said as Ellie looked down and fidgeted with her fingers. Nira then thought of ways to make small adjustments, like adding a sling with the help of her mother as well as iron sights that would help her aim better. Maybe even an attachment rail to mount a scope so she could pick off targets from a much larger distance. As the twins were conversing with one another, Amiria was still recovering from her shock. Those pebbles penetrated the pillar as well as pierced the shield that was supposed to prevent everything from leaving the platform. She said in her mind as she looked at the hole in the shield using her impressive elven eyes. This is the kind of weapon nobles and kingdoms will fight over. I cannot let it or its creator fall into the wrong hands, she thought as she walked up to the twins, who were busy with each other's company. The twins stopped talking with each other when they heard a clap from Amiria, who was approaching them. That was a very impressive display, Nira, Amiria said as she stood in front of the twins. Thank you, Lady Amiria, Nira said. I must warn you, though. Nobles, kingdoms, and countries will fight over this weapon if word gets out about its existence. They may even come for you when the time comes, as well as your family, to use them as bargaining chips in exchange for your loyal service. Amiria warned as Nira thought for a second. She's right. They would come for my friends and family if they found out a weapon like this existed and if they knew I was its creator, Nira thought. I understand, Lady Amira. I would be extra careful when using this weapon. Nira said as Amiria nodded. Now that Nira has shown us her prowess, do you care to show yours, Ellie? Amiria said as she turned to the short-haired twin. Sure, why not? Does this platform create any soft dummies for me to practice on? Ellie said as Amiria motioned for them to follow her down the steps. Unfortunately, the platform could not accommodate such targets. So we would be using these instead, Amiria said while she pointed at five straw dummies that were lying on the floor. The twins and Amiria got to work, carrying one dummy eka upstairs and into small holes provided by the stone platform. Nira and Amiria gave Ellie some space to work with. Ellie then drew her saber as she set her feet into a combat stance. With swift movement and graceful maneuvering, she reduced the two dummies to shreds easily. As she prepared to strike down the third, she placed the blade to strike the dummy as they suddenly felt the heat that emitted from Ellie's actions. Blade ignition. 
she shouted as the blade burst into a torrent of flames. The dummy was cut in half like a hot knife through butter, and the two parts of the dummy were now on fire as Ellie sheet her sword into its scabbard. Ellie then turned towards her sister to see her reaction. Her face filled with joy when she saw Nira and Amiria clapping, and her sister also wore a proud smile. Morfu was gazing in her direction with curiosity. The two girls then approached her and stopped clapping. That was really impressive, Ellie, Nira said as she looked at her sister. Indeed, it was a very fine show of strength, Amiria said while she stopped clapping. Yeah, Ellie, I haven't even used magical enchantment on my weapons yet, Nira commented, which made Ellie feel a bit proud. Thanks, sis, Ellie said with a smile of her own. Now that is over, shall we start preparing for our quest later tonight? Amiria said as she stood on the conduit once again. The whole OK form rumbled as it returned to its original position. Aren't you going to show us what you can do? Ellie asked Amiria as she stepped away from the mana conduit. That is for later tonight, Ellie, I'm sure you would not be surprised, Amiria said. The group then left the proving ground and entered back inside the guild. They have so much time on their hands that the twins returned home, but not before informing Amiria of their departure. Once home, Ellie took a slight break, and Morphe ran up the stairs to take a nap in their room. Nira found herself back inside the forge. She then sat down on the crafting bench as she took out the barrel from her lever action rifle and laid it flat on the table itself. She there. She started attaching a post as well as an aperture to help her aim better by using her lightning magical affinity to weld it to the barrel. She then double checked to make sure it did not deform the barrel in the slightest, and after that, she was done. She proceeded to rearrange the spent cartridges she used back on the proving ground. After that was done, she spent the rest of her time cleaning the recesses of her revolver as well as her newly made lever action rifle. After that was done, she got help from her mother, who has experience working with leather, to help her make a sling for her weapon to help her carry it more comfortably. 23. Chapter 38 ominous feeling. Nira and Ellie left their house when the sun was setting. They had found Amiria, who was sitting on a bar stool with a drink in hand, waiting for them. Ah, you have arrived. Are you both ready for our little expedition? Amiria said as she stood up from the bar stool and left the payment for her drink. Yep, we're ready. Nira here just needed a bit of time preparing her weapon. Ellie then pointed at Nira. The latter was examining her firearm for any last minute checks. What? She said this, looking at the two. Morphe Tilda the Vulpin Fox then nuzzled his head onto Nira's and returned to his lazy position on her shoulder. Nira then slowly patted his head and thought about what Morphe finds to be his favorite food. She'll have to find out once they return home. All right, let's get going then. Amiria then led the way outside the guild. By the time they left town, the sun had already set and darkness covered the land. The cold wind blew against their bodies as they walked up north to find out why the monsters were running away from the northward forest. Achoo! Ellie let out a cold sneeze as they paced toward the forest. Nira then gave Ellie a coat so she could stay warm. As for Nira, though, she was wearing a black tunic along with leather shoulder plates, which the vulpin on her shoulder found comfy. Amiria, who was in front of the twins, then raised her hand while she gazed at the forest that was in front of them. What is it, Lady Amiria? Nira said as she walked up to her. I feel a very dark and evil mana that is coming from the center of the forest. I think we have found the reason why monsters are coming out of this forest and invading nearby forests. Amiria said as she gazed down the dark forest with her enhanced eleven eyesight, which was much more capable than those of a human. Weapons out, you too. Remain vigilant because the source could likely be very dangerous. She said this while she pulled her golden bow, which gleamed a little gold along with revealing her quiver. The twins pulled out their weapons, Ellie unsheathed her saber as Nira held her rifle. The latter started loading her rifle with ammunition. Amiria looked back at the twins to see what they were doing, and she got a nod from the two, confirming that they were ready. Morphe jumped down from Nira's shoulder as his secondary colors changed from blue to black. The group then entered the forest. It felt very eerie because the normal sounds of the forest, like birds chirping or the sound of bushes rattling from the movement of small creatures, couldn't be heard. They paced around the forest slowly. Amiria already had her bow drawn in case of any surprises. As they slowly walked around, they noticed that the atmosphere only grew darker and darker the closer they were to the center. The twins followed Amiria, who was using her magical senses to track the source of the evil energy. Ellie was getting really scared because she doesn't fit well in eerie and scary places. They suddenly heard murmuring which caused Ellie to slightly jolt. 
Amiria and Nira then saw something glowing blood red in the distance. As they approached it, they heard the murmurs that sounded more like chats grow louder and louder. When they peeked behind a bush, they saw something truly ominous. Five people, all dressed in cloaks, were standing on the points of a five-point pentagram. In the center was a man who seemed to be opening the insides of a dead deer. The pentagram they were standing on was drawn using animal blood, according to Amiria. And the person who was standing in the center slowly stood up with his arms above his head. What are they doing? Ellie said as she grasped her blade tight. I wish I was wrong, but I think they're trying to summon the demon, Amiria said, which brought dread to the twins. You're bluffing, right? Please tell me you're bluffing, Ellie said in denial. SHHHH, they'll hear us, Nira said as she looked at the group of hooded men and sighed that they were not noticed. We need to stop them before the ritual is completed. Nira, position yourself adjacent to me, the both of us will pick off the farthest ones while Ellie takes out the closest. If we do this correctly, they will be surprised and start panicking. Amiria said as the twins nodded in agreement. Nira slowly positioned herself where Amiria had told her and aimed her rifle at the three men farthest from their position. Ready? She heard Amiria and nodded. Now! Nira let off a shot aimed at the farthest person from her position. She managed to hit the man in the head, which caused him to lay down dead on the ground with a hole in his head. The others were so startled by the initial sound of a firearm shooting that one did not see an arrow that was aimed at his position, which caused two more to get killed. After pulling the lever on her rifle down and back up again, she let up another shot, which hit the one in the far left. Again, he lay motionless on the ground. Morphu then jumped from a bush in his big form and bit one of them in half. They followed the big fox and charged inside the circle as Ellie jumped up and whispered. Blade ignition her sword burned brightly as fire consumed it, and swung it towards the person in the middle, but was met by an invisible reddish shield. You fools, the man said as he smirked under his cloak. You just finished the ceremony. He shouted as the blood from the five dead men left their bodies and started to converge towards the center of the pentagram near the hooded man. No. Nira Ellie, get away from there, Amiria said, to which both complied and ran back towards Amiria's position. A spark suddenly came out from underneath the man's feet as he giggled away while a torrent of flames burst forth from the pool of blood made from the blood of the men that they had killed. Something emerged from the torrent of flames, a man with blood-red skin, a handsome face complete with horns, and an accompanying tail. He wore something akin to that of a berserker, with a big, black twisted claymore that he carried behind his back along with a shirtless top the group looked on in dread at the figure as it looked first at Amiria, then Ellie, and lastly, Nira. His eyes glowed a dark purplish color when he gazed at Nira. He then started a full-on sprint towards her position. 19. Chapter 39. Dire Situation. Nira sensed the incoming danger in front of her, so she dived to the right to avoid the attack. She rolled on the ground, sliding back as she fired around into the demon's torso. The bullet did little to no damage due to the demon's tough skin, which caught Nira off guard. When the demon launched another attack without pulling out his blade, its arm was met with a parry by Ellie's sword. The girl gritted her teeth as she deflected the arm that was reaching for her sister. He's targeting Nira. Don't let him get close to her. Ellie shouted as she avoided a slash from the demon. Said demon has now fielded his large, jagged, and twisted blade since Ellie came into the fray. The force of his swing was so great that Ellie could feel the wind as it almost made her trip. Ellie tried to parry another swing that was aimed at her but the force that was applied to her sword caused cracks in it as well, sending her barreling towards a nearby tree. Morphu then came in with a shot from his fireball, which did little damage. The demon started charging at the Vulpin with speeds that were comparable to a person on a motorcycle at full throttle as Morphu stood his ground and erupted a wall made of stone between him and the demon. What Morphu didn't realize was that the demon was able to slice through his stone wall with ease. Morphu realized the danger he was in and jumped back beside Emiria who had fired a barrage of arrows in the direction of the demon. The demon staggered, only missing Morphu by a millimeter. Nira, I need your help fending him off while we wait for Ellie to recover. Amiria shouted as she fired another three arrows at the demon. Said arrows gleamed a green color, and they kept that glowing color as they flew past Nira and into the demon, which caused him to stagger a bit. Nira nodded as she started putting down round after round until her magazine was completely empty. Morphu, cover me while I reload. Nira said as she started loading cartridges into the rifle one by one. Morphu, he shouted as he charged at the demon dead on. 
His secondary colors turned red as fire erupted around his body when he gained momentum. He impacted the demon with such speed that it could topple down several houses in one go. But when the smoke cleared, the only thing on the demon's flesh that was damaged was a big scratch across his shoulder. Morfu, who was still recovering from the charge, got kicked in the abdomen, sending him to a nearby tree with a pained whimper. Morfu, Nira shouted as she started unloading round after round of .44 caliber fury. Some of the bullets bounced off the demon as he slowly walked up towards Nira again with a hand that was trying to reach her. Nira backed up as he was getting close while spending three more rounds aimed at his chest to deal not a single amount of damage. Blade ignition, shouted a familiar voice from behind the demon as said demon turned back to come face to face with a very hot flaming sword. The hit caused him to stagger, leaving him with a big slash wound in his chest. He held his wound with one hand as he faced attacks from Ellie with the other. Nira took the chance to reload and fire shots at him. Some of the bullets barely bounced, but one penetrated through the back of the thigh which caused him to kneel down due to the weight of his upper body. Nira noted the weakness as the demon knocked Ellie back with a hit to her steel armor, which was dented beyond repair with the hit. Amiria continued to fire arrow after arrow at the demon, each one causing him to stagger backwards, as Morfu, who has now recovered from his previous hit, was also bombarding him with fireball after fireball. They feel like they're finally doing damage until the demon makes them all crash to the ground with a roar followed by a dark wave of evil magic. Nira was the first to recover, as she noticed that her friends and companion had been knocked out due to the blast. The demon turned back towards Nira, and as he did so, all the damage he received from her companions was immediately healed. Nira looked on in terror as she continued to unload her lever action rifle until she heard a click from it, which made her heart sink. She let go of the rifle allowing it to sag against her body, and let go of her six-shot single-action revolver. She was getting desperate until she felt a hand hold her by the throat as she was lifted into the air. She felt the demon turn her head to the side to examine her face. So, you are her, he said while smirking. His deep and terrifying voice echoed as another torrent of flame came out behind him. Nira knew what he was trying to do, so she struggled in his hold as she slowly started to black out from lack of oxygen. When all hope seemed lost, she heard a yell from the other side of the pillar of flames. Elemental break. She heard Amiria shout as a tremendous amount of mana suddenly engulfed the battlefield. A golden arrow suddenly went through the pillar of flames as it hit the demon in the back, making him scream in pain. He dropped Nira, who started coughing, on the ground due to almost passing out from lack of oxygen. The flame pillar suddenly went away as she saw the figure of Amoria, who was glowing a dim green and had her teeth gritted. She let off another three arrows that were slightly bigger than the ones she fired, which caused the demon to stagger back away from Nira. Nira. His thighs are the weak spot. Immobilize him for me so I can kill him. She shouted as she continued to fire arrow after arrow. The demon the looked towards Amiria's position with anger as he started walking towards her. Nira loaded two cartridges into her rifle and shot one at the back of the demon's thigh, which caused him to kneel down. She cycled the action again with the pull of the lever and shot the other thigh, which made him kneel with his two legs. Get out of there! Amiria shouted as wind elemental mana coursed through her arms and into the arrow that was loaded in her bow. Nira immediately got up and ran to safety as Amiria aimed up with her bow. Arrow barrage! She shouted as a shockwave was produced by her shooting the charged arrow into the sky. A few seconds later, the arrow came falling back down, but this time, with hundreds of arrows they started peppering the demon, causing extreme damage and leaving him with so many wounds that it was impossible to regenerate. After the rain of arrows stopped, the demon was lying on the ground, and the arrows disappeared, leaving huge wounds behind them. Nira walked up to the demon with a revolver in hand and ended it with a shot to the head through the eye at point-blank range. The demon is now dead, and its summoner is long gone. Probably got the chance when the demon first appeared. Nira fell into a sitting position as she realized she needed something much bigger to deal with demons. 20. Chapter 40. New Companions and Enemies. I is it over? Ellie's voice came as she slowly stood up, her armor dented, and her sword cracked. Yes, it's over, came Amiria's voice as she was kneeling due to expending too much mana at once. Morfu. The Vulpin then walked towards Nira, worried about his companion's status. He also shrank down to his little fox form as he was very tired from the ordeal. I'm okay, Morfu. Nira was kneeling when Morfu came close by. So she gave the small fox a head pat, telling him she was alright. 
Morfu. Morfu said as he purred to Nira's pats and went to take a little nap while curled around like a small fluffy bagel. Nira proceeded to pick up the vulpin and place him on her shoulder, after which she met with her companions. When she did so, Ellie stood up and hugged her tightly. I'm glad you're okay, sis. Ellie said she was relieved that her sister was not taken from her. Nira patted Ellie's head as she hugged her. After a few seconds, Ellie let go and walked up towards Amiria, who was inspecting the demon's carcass. I'm relieved you're all right, Nira, Amiria said as she looked at her. But now, on to more pressing matters, she added while looking back at the body of the demon they had killed. Why was this demon aiming to capture Nira and take her back to the underworld? She said this as she started pondering possible reasons why it would do that. Before the group could get another good chance to look at said demon, flames suddenly burst out, covering its entire body, and within seconds nothing remained but a small fire in the demon's place. I guess we won't have a chance to bring that back, Ellie said with a hint of sadness. Indeed, we have to report this back to the guild. Report that there is a cult out there summoning demons from the underworld for reasons unknown. Amiria said the twins naturally agreed. We should retreat back to the guild without the ominous energy that filled this place. Monsters will start to come back, and we'll be forced to fight our way out. Nira commented. Agreed, let's get out of here, Ellie added as she turned towards the town, with Nira and Amiria following suit. Inside an undisclosed location, the hooded figure that summoned the demon earlier walked down a long hallway with luxurious interior designs very reminiscent of old gothic. The man approached an enormous set of doors as two guards with a big and tanky build opened them revealing a huge room that could fit any type of occasion. And in the middle of said room is a table with a map of the entire world on top of it. Have you finished your task? Another hooded figure is seen across the table, sitting on an expensive looking chair. His voice was raspy, almost whispering, but the summoner remembered that he only does this to hide his true identity. Yes, my lord. But some complications happened during the summoning, he said as he kneeled down in front of the other hooded figure. What kind of complications are you mentioning? The Lord's voice reverberated inside the enormous room, and it almost sounded like he was a bit dissatisfied. The summoner tensed as he felt the weight of his Lord's gaze bear down upon him. I was successful in summoning the demon, but some adventurers were able to eliminate it. He said this as the other hooded figure let out a angered, piercing stare that would make any human break down. But, my Lord, the demon seemed to have pursued one of the adventurers, even ignoring the damage it was receiving from the earth too. It was about to take her to the underworld before it got killed by what seemed to be an S-rank adventurer, he explained, as he hoped this would bring his lord to calmness, which it did so. I see. The hooded figure then leaned forward and placed his elbows on the table while crossing his fingers with one another. What does she look like? He questioned. A mature girl, probably older than 18 years of age. She has black hair tied to a ponytail with red eyes wielding a strange weapon I have never seen before. He explained, give the order to the others to start mobilizing. The time of rapture is upon us. The hooded figure said as he stood up, glory to the new empire the summoner shouted as the good looking figure nodded, which was a sign that the summoner was dismissed. The summoner left the room with the door closed behind him. The hooded figure sat back down on the chair while looking at the map of the world on his desk. Glory to my new empire. He said as he stabbed a knife at the capital city of Ceres. I see, and no one else has heard of this incident. Guildmaster Victor said as he was finished being briefed by Nira, Ellie, and Amiria. No one Guildmaster, I suggest we keep this a secret and state an official report as a dragon nest was created near the forest. Amiria said. All right, I will pass this on to the guild boss himself. Hopefully, with the help of other S-rank adventurers, we would get to the bottom of this demonic summoning cult. Victor said as he started writing the fake report of the incident. Indeed, as for Nira, I would suggest she go out with a very capable guard since she will be the target of the demons until we can find out what they want with her, Amiria said. And for that reason, Nira Augustine I, Amiria Faberos, will travel along with you to act as your guard until this situation has cleared, Amiria added as she placed her hand above her chest. And for the quest you two have done. Expect your C-Rank Guild cards ready by tomorrow as well as getting a new set of armor from us, free of charge Victor added. Thank you, Lady Amiria, Guildmaster Victor. Nira said thankful that she'll have some help with this threat looming in the corner. 14. Chapter 41. Dilemma. Next. When the next day arrived, Nira and Ellie received their C-Rank Guild cards as well as the new armor the Guild had paid for. 
For Ellie, her dented and cracked armor was replaced with a black one-piece uniform that gave her supreme maneuverability and a new red katana with its black scabbard. Nero wondered why Ellie switched preferences, but Ellie just says that her old armor slowed her down, which caused her to get hit multiple times by the demon. Nero had to agree, but she was still weary of her sisters making a mistake. For Nero, her attire consisted of small blackened steel shoulder plates, a white top with multiple bands of red leather strips to support her bust weight and to protect against slashing attacks, a white top with a black leather corset for her torso, and black leather arm guards to help with defense. Nera did feel that the dark blue skirt that hugged her thighs felt a little too short, but she brushed it off after she realized that this set was really expensive and cost the guild three golden coins each. She also felt it would show off more of her thighs since at her back was a leather waist cape that hid her plump thighs from people trying to peek from the back. I guess that is all, the guild maid who handed them their new equipment said. Yep, thanks for the help, Ellie replied while she took a look at her new equipment. It's my pleasure, the guild maid said while she bowed in front of the twins. After they had received their new equipment and ranked cards, they decided to take a break from the tiring night battle that came last night before embarking on an epic quest that would lead them to the next city, Ares. Amiria was also taking a break from the night before and stayed at the guild to recuperate. So, the twins went home, with Ellie taking a nap on the bed, while Nera entered the forge to plan her next advancement. When she went inside, the small vulpin fox Morfu was waiting for her. Hey, Morfu, have you been waiting for me? Nera asked as she kneeled down to pat the fox. Morfu. The fox slowly walked up to Nera and got assaulted with pats. His secondary color changed from black to red. Hee hee, you did a really good job trying to protect me from that demon. Unlucky, he was just too strong, Nera said as Morfu stopped playing with her hands. Morfu. She heard the small fox mutter as his colors changed again from red to blue. It's alright, Morfu, that reminds me. Because of your courageous actions last night, what do you say I feed you some food? Nera smiled softly as she suddenly felt the small fox jump on her shoulder. Morfu, she heard him say enthusiastically. His colors changed again, from blue to yellow. Alright, alright, let's go to the kitchen then, Nera said as she stood up with Morfu still on her shoulder and walked out of the forge and into the kitchen. She placed Morfu on the table and went to grab some food by opening a compartment where their mother stores all of it. Hum, this is a good chance to see what Morfu's favorite food is too, Nira said to herself as she grabbed one of each food item they had. Here you go, Morfu, pick one you like. Nira then laid out the food items in front of Morfu so the small fox could pick. Morfu then got up and started sniffing the food, his nose was drawn by some, but Nira noticed that Morfu wanted to eat something other than meat. So she grabbed all the meat and placed it back in storage. Morfu walked around, trying to find something that smelled good. Morfu's color suddenly changed green as he did so, until he found a rather delicious scent that came from a slice of bread. When he took a bite out of it, he erupted in an explosion of happiness as he consumed the bread in no time at all. Nira noticed this action, so she put away all the other food items and grabbed another slice of that bread. So Morfu's favorite food is garlic bread, huh? Well, I can't blame him, Nira said as she remembered past memories from her previous life, in which she ate garlic bread almost exclusively to save time and worked on perfecting her gunsmith skills. After a few minutes, Morfu had a comically large belly as he lay down, belly facing up. Nira giggled as she poked the belly Morfu was showing. In total, Morfu ate 16 slices of garlic bread. She had to go out and buy some more at one point, but it was all worth it to see her small fox sleep with a satisfied smile. After gently carrying the fox to her bedroom and laying him on the little bed she made, Nira went back down to the forge to start pondering her next course of action regarding her weapon's evolution. The next big leap is smokeless powder. A powder, based on its name, does not produce a lot of smoke or leave a lot of residue behind. This would allow her to produce automatic and semi-automatic weapons without worrying about the weapon jamming. The problem is that synthesizing some would be extremely difficult. She then tried to remember all the components of the powder. Talc, which helps reduce the damage to the barrel, can be mined or bought at the mining guild. Tin extract, which she can just grind into a fine dust, helps with decoppering. Calcium carbonate, which can be bought from the mining guild as well, acts as the stabilizer. Diphenyluria, which would be problematic, but she can get it through burning coconut oil or tree sap. And finally, the hardest one to get nitrocellulose which needs a couple of steps to synthesize, and she needed two types of acids to help. 
sulfuric acid and nitric acid will be incredibly hard to come by, so she needed to take that escort quest to find a substitute for them in this world she still knows little about. The other component she needed is cotton, unprocessed cotton to be exact. She needs to explore and find cotton fields, or find a substitute for them in the form of monster drops. If she were able to produce the powder, it would greatly help her advance further into making more and more complex firearms, but until then, she has to make do with what she has currently until she can make that leap forward. Nira and Ellie in their new outfits. 12. 